Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order at 6.30. Um, do we have any additions to the agenda? Yes. Oh, we do. Usually it's under penalty of death, but we'll let it slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, are we talking about the Kellogg Hubbard Library exclusion? Mm -hmm. That's the addition? That's the addition. Okay. That's the only addition? All right. We'll figure it out. Um, now, are you folks visitors? I'm against the Open North of Savings Bank. Oh, okay. Because we usually have a signing sheet for visitors. I don't know who else is here. Oh, yeah. We can sign. Yeah. Hi, I'm Patty Jumar. I'm a East Montpelier resident. Just yeah. saving some of the topics this evening. Yeah, you could sign in there if okay. you could. All right. Um, the next item on our agenda is review of minutes February 13th, 2023. Very good and comprehensive as usual. And I have a few minor suggestions. Um, bottom of page two. Um, Mr. Etnayer, I would like to amend the remarks attributed to me there to be Mr. Etnayer noted low tech options, comma, like the vertical fluorescent stripe on the signposts that Mr. Kaplan suggested or baskets of flags and then continue. Can you spell K-A-P-L-A-N. Page two at the bottom? Yeah. Oh, Mr. Edna, right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. George, are you happy with the comment that's been attributed to you, sir? I'm tickled. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I guess. And, and then page four, the bottom of the first item, so just before the liquor license applications. I, I did not go back and, and review the video of this, but my memory is that the upshot of all of that was that we authorized the town clerk to process the Plainfield Hardware Tobacco License, recognizing that we did not, as a municipality, have any ability to approve it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So please approve to process. Please. Good catch. Yep. And uh, and then finally at the bottom of page four, same page, uh, how the third line, I guess it's the fourth line from the bottom. Uh, however, the referenced statute is unclear uh, as et cetera, et cetera. So leave that sentence as it is, but then add after member comma, as are the Capital West bylaws. And finally, uh, on page. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Could you yeah. repeat? Uh, I'm trying to understand the sentence. So it's the sentence that begins, however, the reference statute is unclear as to whether the town of East Montpelier or the East Montpelier Fire Department is the member. Yes. And you wanted to add? Comma, as are the Capital West bylaws. Is that clear? No. OK, uh, how about this? period, leave that sentence and then add an additional sentence. Um, he said the Capital West bylaws are also unclear. Um, who, oh, okay, uh, sure. So this, I would, because we might've forgotten who he is, you might just say, Mr. Eitner, Eitner also Mr. said. Mr. Etnayer, we would say. Etnayer, okay, <laughs> thank you. But I think it should be Mr. Eitner with an I. <laughs> you would not be Sorry. the first. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah. oh. Okay. But wait a minute, who was looking at the bylaws? It wasn't you. I, I was. Oh, you were? Yeah. Because uh, Petrella was unclear. Also, yeah, that's what I was mm -hmm. thinking. Yeah. Right, but no, I was I was reading the bylaws as we were talking and made that comment. Sure. Okay. And then finally, I I have not checked in with Mr. with Chair Gardner about this, but uh, Judith, I'm going on my normal presumption that Chair Gardner knows whereof he speaks, and so I think that on page six, under other business, the third paragraph. Uh, the second line, Chair Gardner noted that the town would need to change the ordinance to enforce such a sign rather than put up a sign. Does Chair Gardner agree with that? 
Where is this? I chair Gardner raised the topic of the parking issues. So that's the paragraph you're dealing with. So it's here. Chair Gardner noted that the town would need to change the parking. Oh yeah. To enforce such a sign. That's that's what I said. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that was my understanding of the ordinance. Yeah. yeah. Um, the lack of an ordinance when you put up a sign, right. you can't enforce it. Right. Okay. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Are you done? I'm now, done. what about your um? Uh, that's I want to say there. comment. That's in there. Oh, that's in there. Yeah. Is it accurate? You can, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I suggest you take it home and study it. Oh, I definitely will. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a it's pearls of wisdom, basically. Yeah. Um, do we have any other comments on the select board minutes of February thirteenth? Good minutes. Long meeting. It's great. Okay. That was your comment. That was my comment. Okay. <laughs> Judith. I'm all set. I, I make a motion we uh, approve the minutes with the uh, amendments Carl uh, mentioned. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The ayes appear to have it, they do have it. All right, minutes are out of the way. Uh, public comment is the next thing on the agenda. I see a lot of public here. Does anybody <clears throat> want to talk under public comment or are you here for a specific item? Just, just uh, specific order. Okay, good enough. Um, okay, 640 is review Northfield Savings Bank Services proposal. Megan Siccio, is it Siccio? Siccio. Siccio, yes, yeah, close. 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 Um, Senior <laughs> VP? Yes. Enterprise Banking with Northfield Savings Bank. Yes. Can you take the floor, please? Sure. <laughs> sure. Well, yeah, um, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'm Jason Cecilia with Northfield Savings Bank, and I've um, been with the bank for 31 years. And I presented an RFP um, proposal to um, Michelle and Gina um, on behalf of Northfield Savings Bank to um, potentially have the town of East Montpelier um, do their banking with Northfield Savings Bank. So I've given them the full RFP. Not sure exactly what you would like me to touch on. I'm happy to touch on whatever uh, points of the RFP. Well, what specific items are we going to talk about as far as Northfield Savings Bank? Though? We always have um, they would take over general operations. So we would essentially want to close everything that's an MT. Right. So do we need to go through those things line by line? The I'm not sure how you all have evaluated banking options in the past. Well, generally what happened is the treasurer came to us and they talked about it for a while. And that's basically what we did. And we didn't the actually treasurer. have representatives from the bank come in. Um, but this is probably a little bit more thorough or comprehensive. Um, but we had to identify what we needed from the bank. So we need we need and, a checking account, we need a sweep account. Yeah, we need uh, to, yeah. And we have gone through, Megan yeah. has seen all of the current account structure that we have and Northfield can obviously provide what we need um, in addition to the added benefit that the fraud will stop because we will be closing our current account because um, the fraud has not slowed down at all. Mm -hmm. Our fraud attempts, excuse mm -hmm. me, I should say. Um, <clears throat> but Northfield has some better investment options, has lower fees. Um, we didn't necessarily quantify all of that, but um, overall, just feel more comfortable with uh, local bank. This relationship. So just, yeah, that's been kind of a push on the sector for a while. When we have a local bank, but um, Don was always telling us we didn't have the million dollar something something. I can't remember what it was. But there were a lot of there were some drawbacks he felt to go into a local bank. Yes. Seven fifty five. What's that? Seven fifty five. Seven fifty five. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, it might be sooner, sir. Or later. <laughs> Not later. <laughs> it may be a little sooner because sometimes things go quicker. Okay. Um, so in the banking business, I can't remember the drawbacks to going to a smaller bank because that's basically what we'd be doing. Uh, what is? What are the drawbacks? So we're actually the largest bank headquartered in the state of Vermont, yeah. um, and we've been in business for over 150 years. Yeah. Um, and I had actually previously done an RFP for Dawn, but that was when it was um, still people's 
and you were comfortable with that initial transition from um, Chittenden Bank to Peoples, there was still a, a deeper local presence. Um, and I think that sort of dissipated and you're not the only municipality that's had struggles with the conversion. Um, and so what I did was I put together the proposal. I gave a couple of options because we do have the ability to collateralize your funds. Within the RFP, I did um, a standard checking account and a savings account where um, Michelle and Gina or Rosie would, would be responsible to move money as you needed, as well as an option where it would automatically sweep every night. Um, and that's the option that they wanted to go with because it's the same account structure that you have now. Okay. Um, we have the ability to collateralize your funds for any funds that aren't in, secured by the treasuries. Um, and our online banking platform allows you to customize the control limits of who can do what within the system, who has the ability to approve transactions. Um, we offer positive pay, just like you have now, so you won't have the fraud issues um, in terms of any checks that are not approved. Um, we only pay checks that have been approved by you, um, as well as ACH services, so we can continue to support those needs that you have, and remote deposit capture, which allows you to scan checks right from the office here to deposit the funds into your account automatically. Another big plus for Northfield is someone will actually come on site here to work with us to set everything up and oh, to nice. get everything switched yeah. over. Um, support is certainly something with the transition from peoples to MT that was lacking. And if you talk to someone at MT, they would admit that themselves. Yeah. Um, it just was. Yeah. So that was a big factor for us as well. We did meet with a few banks, but not every bank could offer that, um, that, that on site support. And that was definitely something that was important to us. What does the timeline look like? Did you did you want to say something? Oh, you're mute. Mute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood the two recommendations from the bank, and then the one that um, um, Rosie and Gina, or, or excuse me, uh, Gina was recommending um, that we go with. So, looking at the um, um, the document and kind of the first uh, the first comments um, blurb. Um, I think that's on. Where'd it go? Um, page four. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, page page four. It says there are two recommended options. The first would be to establish an enterprise checking account with interest, which includes a free business money market account. So that's the first option. Correct. Is that correct? Okay. And so, um, and then the second option is the cash, cash management sweep option, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. And so I, I guess I'd be interested in why, Gina, um, the cash management sweep option is kind of the better option of the two from your perspective. With that one, we are not really managing the cash ourselves. So okay. the bank, you kind of almost go negative during the day as any funds are um, basically any checks are cashed or payments process. And then at the end of the day, the bank essentially replenishes the account. Otherwise, we would really have to have a cash management system in house to manage okay. what checks we're cutting, put the money over. It's, it's honestly a better way, in my opinion, too, because you're keeping the money kind of in your kind of interest bearing and then and you use it as you need okay. it. Great, and thank you. And sometimes if you're making a deposit, you won't even have to take out of that reserve. You'll have an excess. And so every night that there's an excess, it sweeps the money into the reserve. So it's a two-way automatic. So if you've spent all of a sudden, you have to pay your school tax payment and you do that and you're running negative, it'll, it'll sweep at the end of the day. It waits till all of the transactions, both the deposits and the withdrawals have processed through. And then it'll either sweep to the reserve account or a sweep from the reserve account, whatever is needed for the town. Okay, well, that's thank the you. one we're recommending. Mm -hmm. Which is what good. we do today. Yeah, yeah yes, that's what we do today. Yeah. Right. Okay. I think this setup is gonna be very similar to what we have now. Yeah. It's just gonna be a bit of bank. Mm -hmm. And it's more local and we've got better service. And no more fraud. Like, and the <laughs> other thing too, so and, and I, I, I actually have relayed this, m and is aware that we are speaking with other banks. Um, and I let our representative know that the other struggle that we have is the m and platform, the online banking platform is very difficult mm -hmm. to use. Mm -hmm. uh, I pride myself on being able to figure out systems fairly easily. This one is not intuitive at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Simple things this is with the credit card, but with the credit card system, I have yet to be able to figure out how to get an online statement to us. 
it, to, or to print and to have it automatically email, I'm sorry, to us. And then even to print it, to select it, it's just a very odd system. It's very difficult to use. Yeah, Michelle has a hard time use it, using it. And that was one of our other big considerations is we simply don't like their platform. Um, and then Michelle's made calls in one day and gotten three different people and three different answers when she's having an issue. Love that. So, it, you know, I, I happen to use Northfield personally, so I'm aware of their online system. And then Michelle looked at it. You know, that was something that we went with Megan, what their online platform looks like. And that was actually one of the driving factors as well for choosing yeah. Northfield. I mean, I use it myself. I'm happy with it. So, uh, yeah, Carl and our, yeah. <laughs> so uh, as Megan knows, I'm a customer at Northfield. Oh, Megan. Um, I, I have a, a question about what other banks you interviewed and what of the other banks you interviewed, why Northfield's uh, percolated to the top, why you're only presenting the, the one alternative to us. We met with Community Bank and Union Bank. Um, Union Bank is very small, um, has only one branch in Barrie. Um, they didn't have any municipals either. They had really no experience with municipals. They're so trying to get into municipals, yeah. but they do not have a lot of clients currently. Like they also, because they are so small, did not have the ability to have someone come in on site support us through yeah. this transition. So yeah. those were the big factors there. Yep. Community Bank was second in line. Um, overall, I think the real factors there were Michelle really liked the online interface with Northfield a little bit better than what we saw with community. Mm -hmm. um, and, and frankly, we just felt a greater rapport with um, with Northfield um, as well and with uh, what they what they could offer. Right. OK, very good. And and then who owns Northfield Bank? We're a municipal savings bank, so we're owned by our depositors. Yeah. Oh. Not the stock bank. And within the RFP, there were um, references from other municipalities so that um, if you wanted to call references as well as your um, CPA would give a reference. <laughs> we actually discussed this <laughs> with the town's extra monitor as well. Um, oh, good. And some of the challenges were when we met with Chad and um, you can find her. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <it that way. laughs> so, yeah, I think one biggest thing that I like about Northfield Savings Bank is customer service. I mean, mm -hmm. we use, I mean, you can actually talk to a human, snap of the fingers, get an answer. It's just, it's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a lot of ease. Yeah, I agree. Uh, got more questions? Hey, hey, Seth, can I ask a question? Sure, you can. I don't know who you are, but go ahead. Uh, You're kind of dark. Yeah, I know. A Amy, Amy set this up. Can you blame that on her? <laughs> yeah. Um, we say a uh, silhouette. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm, I'm in a I'm in a dungeon, so I'm in I'm in Carmel's basement. She locks you up before she leaves. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, bread. Yeah, the Unitarian congregation. Uses... Uh, joke, joking aside, would you introduce yourself for the record? Yes, uh, Scott Hess, um, citizen on North Street and is a resident of East Montpelier. Um, just a quick question. I'm curious about your, the cash sweep, um, since it's a competitive environment and. And uh, the rate structure is obviously different than a year ago. What, how many basis points, or can you can you just describe a little bit about our idle cash that's swept, and and what type of um, rate structure or um, interest interest bearing we can we can anticipate? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Thank you. Um, because of the balances within the account and the, the fact that they exceed um, over a million dollars, the average collected balance, um, we look at rates as often as once a week traditionally. And the rate is currently for over a million dollars. It's a yield of 1.25. The rate is 1.24. Okay. Um, and maybe a little a further question um, Is there opportunity to? make investments in short-term um, investment vehicles? For instance, if we knew for the next month we weren't going to use $500,000 that we could that we could purchase T-bills that are now you know, somewhere around 400 basis points, is that is that an option that would be available for, um, for East Montpelier? If the town wanted to do that, I don't know what your um, investment policy is, but I do have a um, page within there for Northfield Investment Services um, mm -hmm. that we could, and I have offered um, that we could have an investment advisor come out so that you could look at options for some shorter term investments that would still provide you with FDIC coverage 
or some collateralization that the town should require for all of their deposits, as well as I did um, include within the RFP, I had actually done the RFP, um, I think it was back in October, and then we updated it um, because the rates had changed and some of our CD specials had changed. I've also put the nine month CD special here for any excess funds if you wanted to keep them collateralized within the bank. And that nine month CD is paying three and a half percent today with a minimum balance of $1,000. So the, the benefit of municipalities is we have the ability to collateralize funds in excess of $250,000, where most borrowers are capped at that $250,000 coverage limit through the FDIC, unless you have a ICS or a CDARS account. With the municipalities, we can guarantee the funds on deposit. Okay, thank you. So You're certainly, very certainly opportunities for a lot of excess income at this point for for the town. It's, I mean, it's real money at this point. Thank you. You're very welcome. And that would be up to the town and the select board in terms of your investment strategy. Yeah. We go look at that later. How big is our investment policy? I was going to say, like, I, I've never, I've never been. Well, no, we have some CDs, but if you want to. But I don't so think we, don't we have, have a policy. Though. I don't think we have a pot. I don't like, you can't do, I mean, like for instance, no. like just, Right. Yeah, we have yeah. fund balance policy, but that's no, 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 there is yeah, no Bitcoin. There is no options, policy, probably. Yeah. yeah, there is an investment policy. Yeah, you'd have to. Yeah, you'd, you'd have to look that. at that. Yeah, yeah that would. That's yeah. kind of a separate. Yeah, a little bit of an issue though. Yeah. So just to tie up the uh, banking thing is what we really need to do. Is is there anything else you want to tell us? Unless you have other questions, I. Who's got questions for? Megan. It's okay. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. How long will the transition take? Um, so basically what will happen is I have all the paperwork with me that in the event you approve it, I'll leave it with Michelle. She'll, she'll get signatures. Um, and what we'd like to do in this situation is we'll get everything set up. I've actually already, already um, got the platform sort of built, waiting yep. for you to give the green light so that we'd have your um, positive pay, your ACH, yep. and your remote deposit capture will come on site. We'll load the new scanner. We're providing the new scanner for free for you um, so that you can get rid of your old scanner. And we'll get all the checks ordered so that when you're ready to go live, we'll be able to work with um, Michelle and Gina to get the files, the ACH files rebuilt for all your um, records and then we'll when you're ready to go live you can go live i think we should have a motion then. so move <laughs> we have a second second the, the motion is to transition to north of savings bank. To transition our banking services to northfield savings bank as recommended by the uh, municipal staff is that correct okay okay sounds good do we have a second yeah. Oh, Amy, second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The ayes appear to have it. Did you say aye, Judith? Yep. Okay. The ayes appear to have it. They do have it. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Thank we, you. Yeah. I'm sorry, I do smell like popcorn. Yeah. That's very odd. <laughs> I smell it on myself. So I do a popcorn. I, yeah, I, I just want to say, we, as you mentioned earlier, Seth, we've been talking about getting yeah. our money into a, oh. a local bank for a long time. And I'm yeah. really glad to see us take it. I think it's up. a good move. There's no question about it, especially with the problems we have at MT. Yes. I mean, people's was different. But once you move to MT, it's like this is all going downhill. In a yeah. Hurry. yeah. So. Okay, 655. We're right on schedule. Sullivan and Powers FY 2022 audit report presentation. Chad Hewitt is here, I believe. Sure. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yep. You too. Chad, I bet you're going to fall over your seat there when they were saying there wasn't any investment policy. Oh, <laughs> 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 we really good. I guess we've got one. <laughs> I, I really thought there was. We have an investment policy. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this is exciting. We have an audit report. It's awesome. It's so hot. Yeah. Yeah. Exciting stuff. Wow. So, wow. Um, hi, my name is Chad Hewitt. I'm, I'm one of the partners at Solon Powers and Company. And actually, over here is this uh, Jordan Plummer. He's uh, he's another partner. He was he was still working at the office tonight. I said, "Hey, come with me and meet these people." <laughs> so, so both Jordan and I uh, actually worked worked on the audit with a couple other team members. And uh, actually, at our office, we actually have uh, two other partners actually work on it, just different segments of the of the audit. So, 
but this is the first year we've been doing the uh, town audit now for six, seven years, maybe? Since 2014. Yes, okay. Who's the it, longest one you've done with? Uh, this 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 this, this uh, town up north. Uh, you, you've ever heard of it? It starts with the H. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I can't remember the name of it. So. It never comes out. Yeah, that's, 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 it. that's it. That been, been up there quite quite a while. So, yeah. so anyway, in in the past, uh, um, Bruce has said, "Oh, they slept more. They, they don't care about the audit. We we, we, don't, we don't need to go over there." So, but this, this year, Michelle and Michelle Gina asked us to come and, and present and. Uh, um, but so just just starting in again. I'm sure you guys have read this from cover to cover. But well, we just got it, really, right? Or just yeah, we got it. We got it. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. yeah. So, so do you, do you get allowed time to read this? Oh, absolutely. No, no it, 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 it'll, it'll it'll put you to sleep. So. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. So, I, so actually, so on a, on a serious note, um, again, you you have here a a 50, 58 page document here. And uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of information in here, but what I want to what I want to do is actually just kind of point out point out a few things here. Um, pages pages one through five is is what's called the independent auditors report. This is the only thing that's really uh, solemn powers. It's, it's our opinion. It's our it's our uh, re response to you guys saying uh, uh, how the audit went. You guys are getting uh, what's called a clean audit or professionally referred to as an unqualified opinion and which, which you can you can't get anything anything any better than that so mm -hmm. um everything everything after everything after this i'm sorry actually i, I, I like here there's a few other pages here but but um the, the next pages i just want to re, kind of refer to is is from pages uh four through four four through nine yeah. And what this is, this is called the management discussion and analysis. Otherwise, I mean, John's written these in the past, but this is a glorified select board report. It's, it's really for the for the layman to read this five pages and figure out. You kind of you get all the municipal facts, or, or, or they all all the financial facts of how the town did, as opposed to reading the other fifty pages in the report. Right. It, it's really just a layman's term in. Uh, this kind of tells the results of, of operations. So I would, of all, of all the pages that's, I mean, other than our opinion, this, this is probably the best document out there just, just to read this. So um, go, going a little bit further, I'm gonna skip over uh, pages uh, 10 and 11. And the reason I am, these are these are what was called government-wide financial statements. It, it, it talks about the, the town of East Montclair at a, as, a, as a whole, and it talks about capital assets, and it kind of treats you as a business. Uh, that's not really the case for, for East Mount Pillar because you guys are really in what's called fund based, which you have your general fund, you have all these reserve funds. So that's that's the main focus of the audit. Um, look, look at page 12 and 13. Th this, is, this is where the majority of the work is done here. Um, page, page, uh, page uh, look here. I'm sorry, page, page 12. So it's page 12 and 13. You'll see here that there's there's five there's six columns. Uh, there's there's a general fund, capital reserve fund, community fund, and most recently the ARPA fund. And then there's a fifth column called non-major governmental funds. The premise of our audit is really focused around what we call major funds. And major funds, I mean, it's it's really kind of like it sounds. It's the most important funds of the town. And I mean, and not that the other funds aren't as important, but but again, from a financial aspect. Um, I mean, these are these are the, the big the big hitters the, he the heavy hitters of, of the town. So, look at look at that, the, the furthest to the left column, general fund. Obviously, we know everything about the general fund. That's what we live and die by. That's that's what our, our budget is. And about three quarters of the page down there on the, on the left hand side, down in, under the fund balance section, it actually talks about how much money, how much fund balance the town has. And you'll, you'll see that the, the town, as of June 30th, 2022, so this is a snapshot in time, the town, the town had 600, and just, just shy of $658,000 of fund balance, which, which, is, which is great. And, and then that fund balance is broken down into three pieces. Um, $38,000 of it is what, what we call non-spendable. What that is, is where you bought, uh, well, you've kind of prepaid items out there. You prepaid your insurances and stuff like that. So you can't get that money back very easily. So that's just a, that's just kind of a segment. Uh, there's another $192,000 of fund balance that is considered assigned. And that's where you as a select board member, members have, have tentative plans for this money. And what this, what this is made up of, of the 192,000, 
what uh, actually I just I got turned a page uh, turned to a page to figure out exactly what it is here. Maybe eighty or something like that. Uh, no, actually, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars of your fund balance is money that you've given back to the voters oh. in FY twenty three. So what we're saying is here we have all this fund balance on June thirtieth, two thousand twenty two, but one fifty is assigned. We're going to designate it. We, in in other words, we hope to lose one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. In fiscal year 23, if our budget projections come to fruition, there's another $30,000 out there that's assigned for compensated absences. That's just basically a reserve out there so that, uh, and you most recently just used it when you paid out Bruce. It's, 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 for, it's, for, it's for vacation payouts that, that are unexpected by, by your employees. Uh, then there's $10,000 still remaining for the treasury transition. That was like whether or not Don has come back come back in or, or help at all. But then again, that you might not need that at all. And, and lastly, there's like $2,500 of recreation money that's still sitting out there. That's, again, it's part of the general fund of it. It's, it's earmarked for recreation. Then it leaves the unassigned number. The unassigned number is truly the, the money that has not been uh, definitively assigned for any purpose. It, it's your, it's your it's, I don't want to call it your such fund, but it's really your, your rainy day fund. And that's four hundred and twenty-six thousand dollars. Now, of that four hundred twenty-six thousand, we got breaking it down into, into a, a one piece. There is the town has set up an emergency reserve fund. I want to say four or five years ago, or I, I can't remember exactly, yeah. but yeah. but of that four hundred twenty-six, two hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars is what's called your emergency reserve fund. Yeah. Um, but that, that again, it's it doesn't have a. It doesn't have a specific purpose, but it's truly, as you say, for emergency reserves. Yeah. And and then it, then it just re, so 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 of the four twenty six two hundred eighty seven thousand is just sitting out there for emergency reserves, and then that leaves about one hundred thirty nine thousand dollars of just true surplus. I mean, just that can be used for anything. Um, like for instance, I use uh, uh, I, I think uh, John was actually up in Hardwick. Uh, I use this example all the time. The reason to have fund balances. Uh, Hardwick one year had a uh, had a flood in the Moyle River, and he had to go out and, and hire a crane to. I think it was be there. Maybe it's Dan Hill. I can't remember. I uh, had to hire a crane to beat up the ice in the river. Well, they obviously didn't budget the thirty. They didn't have a budget for thirty thousand dollars, but that's why you want to have a uh, fund balance. And uh, so it's just stuff like that. Is so having having that having that available fund balance is is, is good planning. We actually had a town manager one year that uh, he uh, he's an ex Navy SEAL. And he blew up the ice, the ice jam. Mm -hmm. It's safe getting a crane. Out. I was gonna say that was ice went everywhere. Look at the next. So look at the next column over capital reserve fund. You guys all know the capital reserve fund, but basically the town is sitting on one point eight million dollars of, of capital reserve money. And I know you guys have a capital reserve plan. You have a lot of plans for this money. Uh, the third major fund is a community development fund. It's, it's not very active, but it's but it's when the town uh, got a, got a community development grant, and I know you lent it over to the place over there. Uh, I, Sandy Pines. Yeah, Sandy Pines, and and they keep they're repaying the money, and as they repay the money, you guys have to give the state of Vermont back a little bit of it, but you got to keep it for future community development. Then the the fourth major fund is, is obviously you're the newest fund for for 2022. That's your ARPA fund. Um, you see here, you got. You have three hundred eighty-one thousand dollars as of June. That amount pretty much doubled in fiscal year twenty-three, I, I believe. Yep. And uh, and as as of as of the time of this audit, you guys hadn't had any. You haven't definitively defined how you're going to use the money yet. Is that correct? No, some. Some, some, some. So then, anyway, there's three hundred eighty-one thousand dollars of, of money still out there that you received that you haven't spent yet. And that's why it's that's why we, we show the asset, but. You don't see it in fund balance because we, we consider it what's called deferred revenue or unearned revenue. You received it yet, but you haven't, haven't really earned it yet. You haven't figured out what, what it's going to be spent on. Fifth column is what's called, called the non-governmental funds. Again, we, we, spend, we have less emphasis on these funds. There's a lot of small funds. The majority of it is a reappraisal fund. You have $146,000 in there. You have the, your cemetery fund of $120,000 in there. Then, then there's a, just a bunch of other small funds. But again, they're... There's there's uh, there's schedules in the back that kind of show these 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 non-major funds, but again they're they're not as significant. 
Uh, I just want to turn a page to exhibit D. Exhibit D is, is like, well, exhibit C was, was basically the balance sheet of, of the town. Exhibit D is a, it's basically, in other words, it's your income statement. It's, it's also referred to revenues and expenses and changes in fund balance. Um, it, it's a kind of a global look uh, of, uh, of the town's finances, but, but I'm going to look just about near the bottom, bottom section here. Um, the, the third line up, you'll see a line that says net change in fund balance. And really what that is, that is the, essentially the profit or loss uh, for the year. And you'll look at the general fund there and you'll see the general fund lost $89,000. And you're going, oh my God, we lost 89,000. But remember, the town had budgeted to lose $100,000 because that's what, for this fiscal year, you gave back to the voters 100,000. And when you, when you give money back, that's essentially, you want to lose that. So you came very close to your budgeted projections. Of, and, um, and then your, your capital reserve fund, you'll see there you made, you made you actually had a positive surplus of $332,000. Well, the capital reserve fund, the money comes from the general fund. So 448,000 came into the capital reserve fund from the general fund and you only end up spending uh, between, I think you spent about 120 grand of it. So therefore it, it, your capital reserve fund balance actually increased by 330,000 bucks. Community development fund didn't really have, again, pretty much 15 came in, you sent the state back seven. So the, the, the community development fund didn't change much. And then, then you'll see the ARPA fund. The ARPA fund, there's no, it doesn't show any revenues expenses because the money is still on the balance sheet. It's sitting as, as deferred revenue, if, if you will. Um, the other focus of the, of the audit, I just want, I just want to, uh, from a, from a uh, more of a fine line, getting into the weeds type of uh, detail, turning the pages 40, 41 through 46. And this is, this is a report very similar to what you guys are used to seeing. It's, it's what we call the budget actual. I know on a monthly basis or maybe even every two weeks, Michelle and Gina hand you a, a, a budget report. I, I know John see these over and over, but basically it shows what the town budgeted and, and what the actual res results were. And the, one of the things that's, again, getting really kind of neat is getting back to my initial, co uh, initial comment is that when Michelle and Gina wrote the management discussion and analysis, that they actually tell in here why there are large variances. It's like, like for instance, um, uh, state aid to highways, we, we got $18,000 more than that was planned. And then I think they described it, what there was, the state of Vermont handed out uh, extra supplemental, supplemental payments. Um, property taxes are actually under budget. Well, that's because more people uh, were, uh, were, were delinquent at the end of the year than, than the prior year. Um, you got some, you got some unbudgeted, uh, grants for, uh, Emerald, Emerald dash uh, um, work. And then there's, then, they, then you go to the expense, the expenses, uh, municipal employees, $72,000 more, you spent $72,000 more than actual. And that was a lot of that was, uh, Gina coming on, Michelle coming on, also paying Bruce, uh, while he's here. So those were unbudgeted items. And, uh, and again, there's, I've all stressed this before is that there's, there's never anything wrong with going over budget. The biggest question is, the big, biggest thing is just knowing why. And I, I mean, obviously the, the town is well aware when Bruce and Gina were here, they were gonna go over budget, but then again, they saved in other areas. So, but looking at schedule one, there's, there's a few var there's variances up and down in, in many areas uh, of the budget. But again, uh, the, the, the management discussion analysis kind of does tell the whole story. Um, the, the, large, the largest uh, thing was the highway operations. Um, the, the highway operations came in $64,000 under budget. So um, you can think you can thank your road foreman for coming in our budget to pay to help pay for the additional salaries. So I mean, obviously, uh, um, you, you saved a lot on salt because that's, that's, a, that's a timing thing. Um, saved, saved on chloride. But obviously, mud season last year kicked in the butt because of uh, because of the mud, and that, that happened that happened everywhere. So then there's just a lot of lot of areas were just under budget. So it's just it just cumulated to a to a, a large amount. So um, so said so again, th those those are the, schedule one is more of the finer details of the audits. So um, and again, it's it's got great analysis. The last thing I guess I, I just want to just want to give uh, the the readers. Uh, some insight on is, is what we call our footnotes and, and so really that is pages 17 17 through 40 and it's it, it's really is it gets down into the the finer details of the audit it, it kind of tells about 
Like for instance, uh, I guess in the details about your cash, how specifically how much cash you have, how is it, is it collateralized? Is it, is it got FDIC coverage? Is there anything that's restricted? Um, again, it gets into the, really the, 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 bigger, the b bigger details of cash. It talks about your receivables. Uh, how are the receivables broken down? Is it delinquent taxes? Is it grants? Is it fees? Um, and again, there's kind of every aspect of the audit it gives, it gives more details. There's a lengthy, lengthy uh, disclosure. John's seen this. He could probably recite it about the state's pension plan. I mean, there's, there's like five pages of disclosure about, about Beamers if you really want to look at it. So it talks about the town's debt, the town's fixed assets. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, detailed information in the footnotes that really just kind of support the overall global numbers of the town. So, so those, those are the highlights uh, of the audit. And again, I know that was a, a quick version. And, uh, but, but again, I just think the town is, is well, well funded. Um, and uh, again, there's nothing better than an unqualified, uh, unqualified opinion from us. So, so congratulations on that aspect of it. So. Got more questions? Material um, deficiencies. So, so there's so there's a there there's a uh, management. So basically, you got three uh, you get three three reports from us: the financial statements, a management letter, and an, an audit committee letter. And uh, the, the management letter, what we end up having is there were there were, well, first of all, the town the management letter is broken down into three types of, of weaknesses. Material weaknesses. The town, the town of East Montpelier had zero material weaknesses. Those are what's called the worst. So, which I, I, there's definitely nothing here. Uh, the, the next level are, are what's called significant deficiencies, and that is that is where there's there's an issue out there that the town should address, but it's nowhere as not doesn't doesn't meet the criteria to be a material weakness. And and these are basically uh, issues that are uh, are tough are tough accounting issues. Uh, the first one, and, and again, I think that these have already been resolved because we spent some time with both Gina and Michelle. The first one just relates around uh, grant grant accounting and, and recording the transactions about okay, what what is owed, when it's owed, and, and in accounting terms, it's, the, it's what's called the matching principle, trying to match up okay, when we when we spend it, when we owe it, and and. Uh, so those are transactions that were very difficult, but just needed some assistance on. But I, th I think Gina and Michelle have, have or we've, we've met, we, we talked about it. I don't see that being an issue next year. Were the processes that we were using not what you would suggest? It, it's not necessarily a process. Again, they're, they're complicated. The what, timing. Yeah, what, because again, even, even when Don was here, uh, and again, these are very municipal Special municipal rules is, is, is it, it makes them difficult. So I mean, so Don would even call me every year, and say, "All right, this is how I think it's going to work." So so it's just, and again, it's, they're just it's complicated one-time things that anything is we really want to deal with them at the end of the year. So, right. So. Okay. These entries, from what I understood, speaking with both Don and Bruce in the past, were not posted until the auditors were actually right. on site and posted with the auditors. So unfortunately, for Michelle and I, when we tried to get information on how things were done previously. There was really nothing to go by because it didn't happen until the auditors and there was an entry that was actually posted before our time. That is one of the items that that ended up on that list. And, and we also got to remember that uh, Gina and Michelle were only here a year, I mean, about one month, out, one month out of the 12. So, so a lot of these are, are, are Don's numbers as, as well throughout the, throughout the year. Uh, the second significant deficiency we had is, is, is again, it's, I, I, it's, it's called classification of grant revenues. It's just the fact that the town got some grants in and they, they just got recorded to a wrong account. But I, I get it. I, the fact is, uh, these, these guys came in in June. It's like, okay, what are these grants? And mm -hmm. now I think, I don't think it's going to be an issue next year because they're going to be their numbers. They're going to, they know the grants. And, and at the time, it's just like, XYZ grant got put in the wrong spot. That, that's really what, what that's really what all it was. And uh, the, the third thing, the third thing again, it's a one, one time a year uh, transaction for uh, recording a crude payroll. Is that uh, and again, not, now they know it's just that that first payroll in July where we, where we have to factor in uh, how much time, how many of those hours were for June. It's just a matter of having to get recorded in the into the prior year. Mm -hmm. Again, we've gone over it with these guys, and and I think it's it's just. Uh, I attribute a lot of this to just the transition issues. So, gotcha. 
Um, so so th th then other than that, we had a few what we call other recommendations. And I mean, again, nothing significant at, at, at all um, in, in the, in the, uh, for, for other recommendations. And again, they're, they're, they're just things that we think that could, could uh, make the town uh, a little bit more efficient. Like for instance, one of the issues was the recreation department that we noted is that the recreation department, I know is, is a part of the town. I know sometimes they kind of act uh, autonomous, but uh, like, like when we were reviewing their, the, the, their activity, it's like, okay, I wasn't seeing the deposits only about what, once a month. And it's like, okay, we got to get that money to the bank sooner. We got to get that money to the town. So, so again, th that was, that was just, it's not a, it's not a significant deficiency. It's just, it's just another recommendation that we have. Um, another thing that we've, we've talked about, uh, talk, I talked with Gina and Michelle about is, is a, uh, a fraud risk assessment at some point. And, and what that is, and I'm, good, I'm, not, I'm not saying there's any fraud here at all, but it's, we, we recommend this to every single municipality is that, is that you kind of have a sit down brainstorming uh, session with, with everyone to figure out where can the town be beaten? And we, you, need, you just document it. I mean, um, I mean, I like to come in and think of, or I, well, actually when I come in here, I'm, th I'm thinking as I'm walking through the door, uh, how, how can I be a crook in this place? But, but really, but really what it is, is it's a matter of, of the select board, the, the, the staff and, and just, just trying to figure out, hey, where can we be beaten? Is whether or not, is it, is it- Purchasing parts. Oh, Purchasing parts, it's, it's di diesel fuel. I mean, as, as we all know, diesel fuel right now is it's just, it's just like home heating oil. And uh, I've actually had two towns in the last two years uh, caught people stealing diesel fuel. Uh, right. just, just putting it in cans. So it's just, again, there's there's many different ways. There's and having a fuel pump that, that people would track the amount of fuel you're taking out of it. But if you have a whole bunch of people taking fuel out of it, it's pretty hard to track who's doing it. But every single month you have to quantify these little the kind slips. Of, kind of reconciliation, but right. And that's what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a fraud a assessment. Camera. Fraud, fraud yeah. assessment is just trying to <clears throat> figure out where can we be beaten and how can we, how can we, uh, how can we mitigate it? And again, and we don't deem this as a as a significant deficiency at all. It's just it's just an other recommendation that we feel that the, the town could uh, uh, um, help deter fraud. And the way kind of the way you put it was that uh, we, because we did that, and and the way he put it was that anywhere people can handle money, touch money, have an opportunity, to just get money. But we we have library, water, wastewater plant, you know, all kinds of things are take, taking place in those places. So we looked at that. We looked at the fire department, you know, just sat down and talked to them and said, hey, where do you handle money? How much do you handle? But it's not always, it's not always no. the green cash. No, it's, sometimes it's, it's pieces. It's consumables. Right. It's, it's consumables. Right. Um, Racial I mean, wipers. So, you know, yeah, well, no, exactly. We ran into situations with that. Yeah. But okay. this kind of an audit would not uncover fraud, per se. No, I mean, no, this is, no, not, a, no, this is not a fraud. It, it, no, it's, 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 it, what it is, is an assessment so that you guys can assess where do we think we can be beaten? And, and then, then just try to say, okay, we, we figured out where we can be beaten. Now, what can we do to, what can we do to, um, to, uh, to possibly stop it? And whether or not, and again, a lot of it is just the discussion of it. Right. I mean, and again, I mean, I mean, we always recommend, we always recommend to a town that, that once a year you, you have a fraud conversation with your employees, you, you blame it on the mean old auditors because like, for instance, if, uh, if uh, Rosie knows that uh, Michelle is stealing, okay, we want Rosie. To, we want Rosie to go tell somebody. I mean, that's that's what we want to do. We want to. I mean, same with the highway guys. If highway guys sees Joe pulling, putting diesel fuel in his truck, I mean, we want them to say, "This is the open line of communication, and this is what you do with it." And, but a lot of times, just discussing fraud, it is the it is the biggest deterrent. So mm -hmm. again, are we saying it's happening? Fraud happening? No, we, we're not. We're not saying that. But it, having the discussions that that's that's what we. And again. Uh, this is not a material. This is not a material weakness. It's not a significant deficiency. Just an other recommendation. So, so. Well, we are running. Yep. Yep. Got it. Got it. So, yeah. do we have any more quick questions? And and, and just because I'm, just because I'm leaving now. Yeah. The, oh, okay. I was gonna say just because I'm, I'm leaving. The town has. I mean, we're all our doors always open. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Carl, so, so first of all, thank you for coming in, Chad, and yeah. giving us this this overview. And thank you, Gina and Michelle, for inviting him to come in and talk to us. I, I think this is very helpful. Um, questions in two areas: one about the fraud discussion that uh, you were just talking about the recommendation for. Um, as you've seen, we have just decided tonight to change our banking services from one bank to another, and with a new bank 
comes new opportunities to engage in fraud. How long after we make that transition do you think would be uh, right for having that fraud discussion in the new environment? Well, I, I think there's two different fraud, types of fraud here. I think that what, what Gina and Michelle are dealing with frauds in the bank is outside people, vendors trying to, I mean, they showed me some of the checks where the scam artists are trying to get you money. And that's what, that's what the fraud that the bank is going to handle. The fraud that I, I'm actually just talking about is, is really internal, I mean, internal fraud with employees and stuff like that. So it's really just two different types of, of things. So the, quite honestly, the banking aspect doesn't, doesn't really affect the conversation we have internally. Okay, so that, thank you, that's one. Yep. Uh, the other is that you had, had mentioned, if I understood you correctly, that there's nothing wrong with going over our budget as long as we know why it happened. Yes. Uh, in, well, currently we are having votes uh, uh, mm -hmm. taken every day coming in on our budget for the next fiscal year, mm -hmm. and those will culminate on town meeting day. Uh, could you describe as an outside auditor how you see the town's vote on the budget that we put before them. How does that vote constrain what we as a select board do in the next fiscal year? Uh, I'm sorry, I guess I, I'm not understanding the question. I'm sorry. Um, okay, I, so I, we propose a budget. Yep, you propose a budget. Town votes on it. it let's presume yep. that it gets voted in. Mm -hmm. How does that vote limit what the select board does in oh, terms of spending okay. money? I would say that it doesn't limit that. So let me just give you an example. If this snows every day two inches, you're going to go over your highway budget, diesel fuel, salt. I mean, you're better off having four three foot snowstorms than 40 two inch snowstorms. So, but again, and if you do, if you do go over your budget, it's like, that's, that's where, that's where these guys are going to say, all right, we're, we're going over budget. Now let's find ways to cut. And it might be whether or not you're cutting in different areas. And, and, but, I, but again, another example I, I could use that uh, Rosie could go over on her office supplies because the interest rates are down to 2%. But again, on the other side of it, her recording fees are going to be sky high. So you also want to look at both sides of, of, of the picture. I mean, whether or not you go, you get a, uh, like here, I discussed about the fact that you have some contractor services for, for Emerald Ash Borg, but the other side of it was that you, you, had a, you had a grant to cover that. So, but again, the, the biggest thing is if you go over budget, just know why and, and make sure you have a funding source. And hence, that's why we talked about having adequate fund balance. So basically what he's saying is a budget is your best guess. Exactly. Right. A budget, it's, it's, it's your plan. It's yeah. always a plan. But you're not bound to the budget, but no. you like to stay within the parameters of your budget if possible. Absolutely. But sometimes you can't. Yep. 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 A, budget, a budget is, is, it, it is just, just a plan. Guess. It's just your plan. And, yep. and, and again, and like, like this year, the plan changed because of Bruce leaving and, yep. and hiring these, the plans changed. But again, you knew it was happening. And so... And, yeah. you, and you did, and plus you knew you had a great year in the highway department, so you could get a way to pay for it. So, mm -hmm. so okay, all right. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank all right, coming in. Take care. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Recording in progress. It wasn't what? I wasn't Zoom recording. He oh, my goodness. <laughs> okay. well, well, we have a recording anyway. Okay. 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 So I'd like to move to the next item which is the town treasury report. And we have the January 31st, 2023 monthly reporting package. What is that? That's something that we have to look at. That's what Chad, that's what Chad was just referring to. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Like, yeah. 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 And do we have any red flags here? Pretty straightforward. Okay. That's just, just the two pages that we have here. I'm looking at ten pages. Oh, so oh we've got all that too. Okay. Yeah, I've got that. MIT Same thing you get every month from me. Yeah. yeah. Much. Okay. Yep. So nothing jumped out at you as being unusual. No. Needing attention. No. No. We don't want to rush you along, but we're running significantly behind. It's got an awful lot of items to cover. People waiting for us too. Um, what else is there that you can see? That we have out of line. I don't see anything myself. 
Anything you can point us towards, Michelle? Anything what? That you can point us towards in the... Um, I was just going to discuss the delinquent tax numbers mm -hmm. with you. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Sure. Um, so as of the 22nd, we're trailing a bit behind last year. <clears throat> We're at about 108, almost 190,000 in outstanding taxes. Of that amount, 100,000 are just the current year late and 89 are prior year delinquents, which yeah. is more than last year. Last year, there was only 63,000 at this time in delinquents. And we're so, yeah. yeah. What was it last year? How much? Uh, 63, oh. just over 63 last year for delinquents. Okay. Did you happen to look at uh, the last five years or so? No, because I didn't go back. My well, actually, I, I did go back. In the past. Actually, you we've, know what? I we've guess. seen it. It goes up and down from year it to does. year. It does. It does. I had a cheat. It, it does go up and down. I looked at my office. But there are definitely some that are, they're just adding from year to year. To yeah, year to year. So, so, yeah. So we, we need to get together um, yeah, soon. And I have the list. I have, um, yeah. I've, I've created some letters, um, yeah. some notices. Yep. Um, different, you know, notices to send out to people on a tax agreement based on our policy, but it's a little bit different. So I just want to go through that with you and look at the people in the list and then kind of talk about the process. Yeah. And, you know, the thought was Michelle would kind of go over because Seth has some experience with the way this has been dealt with in the past to go over some that. of her draft letters and then obviously present to the select board the next steps of how communication would then occur with the delinquent tax. Individuals. So we've we've followed a process for these tax sales in the past. Not that we can really find it's a clear, really a very clear, consistent approach in the past, basis. and that's what we're yeah. trying to create. Okay, is a consistent approach going forward. Okay. You could talk to some other towns about that too. Mm -hmm. some towns she actually has gotten some. No, we've yeah. we've had we've had a process. It, 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 it might not be documented, but yeah. we we discussed this as a select board. Huh. We made some decisions yeah. on on setting up some firm deadlines as to when we would start the process. Oh. We worked with our town attorney to initiate the tax sales. Uh, so I think a search of the minutes would give uh, give some indication of what that process was. That's if, that's if we get to the tax sale, but there, we're not at that point yet. Oh, I thought that's the, the point well, that you wanted to- Well, it will be eventually, but we need yeah. to get to the point of tax sale with exactly. all the letters and the, the notices beforehand and then okay. setting up the payment agreement. And Okay. I haven't found okay. any true Got payment it. agreement. Right. The policy Got should it. take should take place right when people become delinquent. Yeah. And then when do you know when do you notice them? How often do you notice them? Do you offer them a contract? What if they don't pay the contract? You have to have that all in there. And that's before they go to tax. So. Exactly. That's right. exactly where we are. Yeah. What we need to get some right. clarity yeah. on moving forward. Yeah. yeah. And we've had a process that we followed in the past. Yeah. I know, but if it's not written, just, just what you're but if it's not, but I don't know why it's not written down. If it's not written, why. it's not it's yeah. not a true process because yeah. it can change for any individual person. It shouldn't be. It should be treating everybody pretty much agree. the same. Agree, hundred percent agree with right. that. Right, <laughs> and and we went uh, when we uh, transitioned from having a separate elected delinquent tax collector to incorporating it into the function of the town uh, man, uh, town administrator at the time, uh, then one of the comments that we made was that we wanted to go from uh, personalized attention to each person to having a, a set of common rules for every taxpayer. So we can work on that, but we don't really have the time tonight to yeah. work on no, that. I have, I have yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll work start on talking it. about it. Okay, that's good. I'm good with that. And then and the next thing. Oh, is, yeah, you go ahead. Okay. So we the RFP is technically up for the external auditors. Fiscal year 22 is the last year in which Sullivan and Powers was engaged to be yeah. our, the town auditors. Yeah. Um, we asked Chad if he could create an engagement letter for fiscal 23 to keep them on for at least one more year as an auditor and delay the RFP process mm -hmm. yeah. um, for the simple fact that they have been doing the audit since 2014. Yeah. Um, they have a lot of history and know how things have been done. It would be very helpful for us, given that there isn't a lot of documentation of certain things, if we can tap yeah. into their knowledge for fiscal 23. So I presented that to the board. Only makes sense. Yeah, so. it, it's when you're changing so many things, it makes sense to keep audit, external auditors yeah. stable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's why we would like to have them continue through fiscal 23. And then we could consider, of course, an RFP at that point, And they would be in the in the running with everybody else. But 
I move to accept the solvent and powers engagement letter for the fiscal 2020 so audit. Yeah, yeah, they have to it. sign this. Is it, is it go up? I think I can sign it by then. Wow. It went up $600, 600. from 15.4 to 16,000. The budget for fiscal 24 okay. is, uh, which we'll end up paying in fiscal 24, is 16.5. I don't so. think they raised it for a while, though, did they? They've only gone up about $300 every year. Yeah. This one's a little bit more. But that's kind of understandable. We've had discussions with Chad, obviously, just with everything else, getting yes. people's difficult. Yeah. So. Yes, that's that was part of the motion. Yeah. Okay, Thank so you we, have the <laughs> yes. we have a motion on the floor then? Yes, we have a motion on the floor. Second. Is there any further discussion about the audit? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The ayes appear to have it, they do have it. Um, Oh, and then the delinquent tax collector update, we're going to put that off. Yeah. We don't have the time tonight to no, go into that. I can send you, like, email the board. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. And then you can take a look and then yeah. we'll start from there. So. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the next item is the village center crosswalk and traffic safety. There's someone here to talk about that? Yes. Oh, I okay. Am. Hi. Hi. Who's Gina, by the way? Oh, hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. So we've been communicating a little bit back and forth for a, a little while now. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know what has been shared with the board. Well, what they have, they have the email um, essentially from John with kind of his proposal. Okay. And it actually does include your email as well. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, I just wasn't sure what to yeah. preface this Melissa, with. will you please introduce yourself for the record? Sure. Melissa Gorham. We live in the yellow house next to the post office. Oh. So we see a lot of interesting things happening there. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, so what, what's bringing me here today was initially your guys um, uh, asking for uh, capital improvements a little while back. And so we said, oh, well, you know, like, hey, this this crosswalk that we see that it was being held up by the orange cone is getting knocked over all the time and it wasn't really safe and, and all sorts of things. So it kind of culminated and it's really become into, for us, a concern for our neighbors and community members of the traffic safety. Um, we all know that this area is extremely busy, um, but we have seen a lot of fender benders, major accidents, or have heard we've seen or heard them uh, in the past seven years. So we just wanted to raise the awareness to folks that there is potentially traffic issues, safety issues happening. I noticed that the town or the um, V trains did come in and put that that stripe down. I drove past it tonight on my way here because I wasn't coming from home, and it's it's barely it's barely visible, you know. So I, I understand that folks are trying to work towards something, but so I will start with um, the crosswalk. Um, we don't use the crosswalk. We we would like to use the crosswalk, but instead of Walking to Fox Market, we will drive because there's a, there's a concern that within the two traffic lights that hold within the town center, there's traffic coming through, transient traffic at high speeds, and they don't notice us at all. So we just choose, we, we feel safer to get into our car to go. Anecdotally, our neighbors also feel the same way of, we'd love to use the crosswalks that were put in town, to increase pedestrian traffic. However, we don't feel safe using the crosswalks going over. So we just wanted to raise that awareness of how, how it's being used in the community. Um, we've noticed that since the, tra the, the um, excuse me, the sidewalks have been put in, there's been an increase in, in pedestrian traffic, specifically school kids. You know, they get off the bus, they'll go to Dudley's and grab an ice cream or whatever they do. And we, we see a lot more people walking on it. But the concern is that it's, just not generally, I mean, we've got a tough area here with Dudley's and the post office and three entrances slash exits from either side that they're commuters, people driving a car, they don't see the pedestrians because they're too busy trying to figure out who's coming out of Dudley's, who's coming in, who's going to the post office. I mean, I think you guys, if you live in, you, you, you see these things. So um, you know, we haven't seen a major accident or heard of a major accident, um, 
but there will be one. And I just want to raise the concern that we as a community should try to think about how can we limit that. Um, the in regards to the traffic, um, 30 miles per hour rarely happens. We used to see the state police um, across at the post office all the time. Um, but again, knowing that we don't have, or maybe we do have a contract with them. I'm not sure you guys will have to tell me. We don't see them as often. So people just, you know, just cruise through. So it's just the visibility of pedestrians and folks on the crosswalk, um, as well as the three to four ways, four ways to engage with the post office slash deadlies. Um, just two weeks ago, there was a fender bender. Somebody ripped off the rear axle and the guy's truck was ripped off right in front of my driveway. I couldn't, I couldn't pull in. <clears throat> you know, I realize we live on a busy route. It's commercial and um, residential transient traffic, but just wanted to raise the awareness that the, the things that we see, because we're so darn close to all of it, um, I just wanted to see if you guys see the same thing. I was going to ask you a question. Do you, um, you know, when you go through Winooski, um, they, the crosswalks there are a mess too. I mean, there's just so many people going through there. Right. They have the ones where you just hit a button and the lights flash and people can cross. Would that help here? Well, we asked, we, that was one of the things yeah. that we had proposed to Gina. We, we actually mentioned, I think it was the, the, the flashing strobes yeah. um, in Pagosa Springs. I saw it where actually there were flags on both sides. So the pedestrian right. would carry a flag. Don't mm -hmm. know. Um, the gentleman from VTRAN suggested a couple of things, maybe a bump out. Um, I, I don't know. That's not my wheelhouse of what the answer might be. The bump out allows but, people to be more... To, to be exposed without being in the road. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. And I just, I just don't know if there's a right answer or what that answer should right. be, but I do see traffic increasing on that sidewalk. It's already increased since 2020. I mean, we just, anecdotally, we just see it all mm. of the time. Um, people are coming down from the trailer park that's just off of 14. They're cruising, you know, all over the place. And it's just I mean, we just, we hear, we hear the fender benders that may or may not be reported. We hear all these things. I and I just, up, live up the hill and I kind of hear them too. I, and I, and I just worry that one day there's going to be yeah. something that where somebody gets hurt. Right. And if we can mitigate that, then maybe we can. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the answer is. So it was just about raising the awareness is what we see. And we obviously, we, we live right next to all of it. So. Well, it sounds to me like um, the state's willing to do some things on that crosswalk. They already did what they were so willing to do. Oh, so they, they put they put a a, a strip a down. Or a and so, but it, I got to tell you, yeah, when I drove fair. through tonight, it it makes absolutely um, no difference. And I don't know, you know, Waterbury has things where, um, you know, because we went down, was it forty to thirty mm -hmm. with the crosswalk? They have that blinking light, you know, that says what the speed you're going. I mean, I don't know what the answer is to get motorists to sort of slow down and pay attention, but it's such a busy area. I mean, every day, you know, between seven to nine and then noon to two, you know, you've got that heavy congestion coming through and people trying to get in Dudley's, get in the post office, out of the post office. I just don't know what it is, but I just, we just wanted to say, hey, it's not looking pretty and something's going to happen. So. Okay. So this letter was written January 25th. Somewhere. Right. That was before our previous meeting. And yeah. we talked about it. And then we've yeah. heard that uh, they've acted yeah. on it since then. They said something about the signs being modified in the spring and summer. And well, I think, well, I think that, our, the, that what he said was going to happen was the strip down the pole mm -hmm. of the crosswalk has already, that happened earlier, late last week. Or that's not the signs like that too, but they're not? No. That's not, not, not. And I don't know. It all looked cleaned up to me a lot better. Oh, it was. Yeah. It was yeah. popping all over the place. Well, well you know, <laughs> so the gone. sign that's at the post office is in um, like the orange barrel. And yeah. we've, we've seen that knocked over because people pull, you know, you can't pull into the post office really well and unless you do a loop. And we've seen people reverse and knock that down. And it's been down for a day or two. And 
I think the um, orange barrel was actually put in place to try to, because the sign had been hit so many times. Okay. So that's from what I yeah. understood from the previous right. administrator. The orange barrel was put there in an attempt to, to make to, it more to visible. try to make it more visible. Yeah, yeah. But people still back into it, they knock it mm -hmm. over. And so it's just bringing to light, like, hey, what we see. I mean, okay. we've obviously got the first. I'd love to hear what Dr. Perry and our room foreman have to say about it. <laughs> uh, what you guys are hearing is what I've been dealing with as well. Uh, same thing, living very near that same spot. It's, uh, you see it, it's definitely a tricky spot. I will say that. I don't know how easy it is to get flashing lights on a federal highway. That's probably a lot more than even, it's, it's gonna be a lot of different agencies involved in that. Um, but the raising of a sidewalk right in that spot, I don't think that's gonna be the answer either. Uh, there's, it's, it's definitely a tricky spot. It's about the only way you can explain it. But I'm open to ideas. Uh, the state threw a couple of different ideas out there. So, well, it sounds like you could put. We could put the flashing lights in. You just have to apply for the uh, <clears throat> the permit to work in the state right away. And the town could spend the twelve thousand dollars for the lights. I checked on lights and you can pr it probably cost about seven or eight thousand for the ones where you push a button and it flashes. Yeah, or something along those lines. I, like that. I think that's yeah. a good idea myself. But the other thing is the barrel idea. Is that I was about to ask Guthrie, when was the last time the sign was hit? My only concern with an investment there is if the sign is regularly hit today, mm -hmm. then the blinking sign is just going to be hit. And what would that cost then be to continuously replace it? I mean, it's been hit. So you can put in a yeah. you can put a pretty rigid pole in there that might hurt the they car more than the pole. pole. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and of you course, cannot put in a rigid pole. <laughs> I like the idea, but you cannot put in a rigid pole. <laughs> Why not? They it needs to that. have, it's got, it's all stuff that you guys have adopted. That's why you see the big green signs all over town. We have rules we have to follow for signs. Technically, that's not even our sign. No, I know, sign. it's a state sign. <clears throat> but you're saying we can't put in a more solid sign there? 100%, you cannot put in a solid pole. Get an empty Oh, it, it, it has to be less rigid so the car could back over it? Is that what you're saying? I'm just, I'm just wondering. I, I don't know. Because you would have to look. I could look in to see what there is, but I, it has to have I that. I see this gentleman out here is raising his hand. I work with the agency transportation. That's my job. Okay. But I can't speak for the agency transportation. Well, I know anything that's in the clear zone has to be a breakaway for mm -hmm. soft because it can't be damaging to the vehicle. Not so much damage in the vehicle. It, a pole can become projectile in the yeah. vehicle or somebody else. You can't have solid objects like that. Oh. And there's a clear zone based on the speed. So there's so far out, you're supposed to keep all ridges. Poles probably within the right of way also. I mean, within the clear zone also. But they have these signs, flashing signs. They have you flashing signs. All through Burlington and everywhere. The problem I think you're going to find with a flashing sign there, if somebody pushes the flashing sign, you have two spot, two lights very close together. If somebody pushed a flashing mm -hmm. sign, you're at, four o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to back trap up through both intersections. Now you're going to have more traffic backing up the road and more people are kind of irate anyways. It is driving now. They don't seem to have any patience to get from point A to point B. And they cut in front of people and you start backing traffic on both sides because of a crosswalk of the light. But traffic both directions, depending on what time of day, it's going to get backed up. Well, wait, as a how general, that, how as a that general that rule, people do not pay attention to signs. The more signs you put up, the less people pay exactly. attention to them. So how is that going to differ from a pedestrian crossing? Pedestrian, you mean like a crosswalk in like Montpelier? No, somebody using the pedestrian crossing there and walking across. That's going to back up traffic too, right? That's going to back up traffic. Yeah. But when you, when you push the button, the people mm -hmm. will take and, well, hopefully they're smart enough to see when there's a break in traffic and make a cross. When you push the button, you're going to force them to stop no matter what it is. Right. So if you have somebody who wants to take it, huh? Pedestrians me. have the right of way. Though. I understand that. I'm, mm -hmm. not, I'm, I'm, I will not argue that, yeah, but okay. pedestrians have the right of way. I'm talking about driver attentiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You put the flashing light there mm -hmm. that you may get them to stop, but you're going to cause a problem with traffic back mm -hmm. up. Or at least that's my past experience with yeah. dealing with traffic. Okay. Um, but you do have a very hard situation with, with uh, uh, between two 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 yeah. lights. Right. Public public places people want to go to, post office, gas yeah. station, Dudley's, in a short area. You get people pulling in and out, and you have very high traffic. Yeah. The answer I do not have to that. Yeah. Uh, my answer would be don't drive. I mean, don't walk. But that would be my answer. But 
That's only because it's dangerous. Um, well, that's what's happening. A sidewalk, anything like ball bouts or something like that, there's going to be a kind of maintenance issue for, you know, plows hitting it. You know, no, that's why around. we didn't do it this time. Right. There's a plowing issue. Excuse Scott, me? Three, you want to say something? No. I, I, like I say, I haven't seen it get hit by a plow. I'm assuming it's mostly delivery trucks from Dudley's that are swinging out around the backside of the post office. No, I don't mean, I didn't mean the signs. I'm talking about if you put ball balls that they have in uh, Danby or uh, Danville or something like that, for big slow traffic, it's a plow, inside town, it's a plowing issue for people to keep clipping the, the those island type things. No, in what, ball what, just to clarify what I've seen, who's hitting the, the orange, so it's, it's people from the post office that pulled in no, and they're backing out. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we've seen. Yeah, yeah. you're just like, huh? Yeah, but yeah. they're not. Um, and it was very new. They weren't used to it. But. So Guthrie, you poo-pooed the idea of a raised sidewalk. Could you explain more about that? Yeah, so we had done that study up on Town Hill, possibly, too, where they were going to raise that entire intersection, Town Hill, Gallison Hill, Razor intersection. Yeah. And it just kind of gives us a little bit of awareness. I, I don't know if how much it's the same thing. You're interfering with a federal highway, so... No matter what we do there, there's going to be some hoops to jump through, but it's something to think about that just brings awareness, especially with the regular commuters that go through there. And if there was a raised sidewalk, even if it's only an inch and a half or two inches over a matter of six feet, it's going to be obvious and memorable. Okay, so so your your objection to that idea, and, and I'm sorry, I misspoke, a raised crosswalk is what I was trying to say. Uh, your objection to that idea is simply the complications paperwork wise of trying to do it on a federal highway in the federal highway it might yeah. be feasible off of it in front of the post office it's going to be a nightmare so i'm saying raising the sidewalk not the crosswalk if you were to raise the sidewalk because that oh, was I one see. of the designs the state had come up with okay right and okay. i don't see that being an answer to anything i see that being more headaches right yeah raising so, the uh, sidewalk so okay, I'm I'm not following you. Uh, raising the sidewalk by the post office, you you like that idea or not? I do not like raising the sidewalk by the post okay. office. Okay. The crosswalk itself. Okay. Where you're crossing the road, that is a different story. Okay. The, and and the the way it's different is that you like the idea of doing that. Is that correct? You think it would yeah, be effective? Yeah. Okay. In the road, I can see where it would be effective. It doesn't have to be a speed bump. Just a raised area. Uh huh. That's a very good. But that, but that does act like a speed bump. That's kind of what we've had discussion many times about raising up an area where people walk across the road in that it does act a bit of a speed bump and mm -hmm. it is a deterrent. However, that's never, we've never been able to get that. We've never been able to do it. Mm -hmm. We've never been able to pull the trigger on it. Except the, right. except the V-chains that happens here. But, that, and, yes, and I, but but you'd have to apply to VT. Yeah. Oh, we got people raising their hands here. Yeah. We're going to have to end this discussion real quickly because we're waiting. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll finish it. I just want to say when we were designing the sidewalks, we had to um, we could not put a sidewalk in front of the post office or in front of Dudley's, and that's yeah. why the curve is where it is. So there's a whole long transition of discussions on that point of putting any sidewalk in front of the post office or even near it. So we'd have to go back to those discussions. Well, and for the record, that's Kim Watson on the planning commission. Well, one of the, one of the reasons we didn't do the sidewalk in front of Dudley's and the post office is because the person that owned the Dudley's at that point was hard to work with and wouldn't give us the permission to do that. Now there's a different owner, right. easier to work with, you know, if that was something that would help the traffic there, I think we could work with the present owner of Douglas. But I'm not sure that's even an, uh, an option as far as safety goes. That's basically what we're talking about. Yeah, we're talking about yeah. safety, and then it is new ownership. We have one other uh, yeah. so present. My name is Michelle McFadden, and Jean Visser and I founded the Village Committee 20 years ago um, to, to work on... Um, all of these issues in our village, and we would never have dreamed that the issue would be so many pedestrians that um, that we need to enhance the safety even further. We fought tooth and nail to get that crosswalk. It is incredibly difficult to get one across the federal highway. Um, so, just a couple a couple of observations. 
One is if you drive north on 14, which I realize is a state highway, not a federal highway, all of those very small towns have a lighted sign that tell you how fast you're going. That's not the same thing as but just making people aware of their speed, possibly in a safe place where it wouldn't, the pole wouldn't get hit might be a good first step. Second thing is, as I remember, we did have sidewalks designed in front of the post office um, and the owner did, I think that, that didn't end up happening, but our solution at the time was to have parking parallel to the front of the post office, so you are not backing out into the road, and, and that would have also um, solved some of this. So you park in, and then, and then you're not uh, creating a hazard. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad you're bringing this to everyone's attention. And, and I'm so glad the issue is that so many people are using, I, I have seen, I, I drive through the intersection each time, 10 times a day, usually, and I have seen many people use the crosswalk, especially elderly people. I, I think that there was not in their capacity to possibly get in a car to get their mail or to drive to either of the, um, of the uh, lights. But um, but they they were crossing at the crosswalk, so I'm I'm I, I'm glad we have it, and I hope it can even get better. Okay, so um, I'm gonna have to end the discussion, but I just want to touch on those two ideas. One is the flashing sign, flashing speed sign. I think it's a good idea. You can put that. In, we've talked about that before. The other thing is traffic control around the post office, parking control is something that I think that we could address. And that's always a problem there. In my opinion, people shouldn't park right in front of the post office and back out in traffic. I just think that's a bad but idea. It's, it's mostly the elderly folks that it's their easy access. But you can, but you can go on the side and, and walk up yeah, that way, right, go around. But, hey. but wait a minute, if, <laughs> if we, we need to talk to the owner of the post office to see if we could do a better job of parking control around that post office and also so traffic went all in the same direction around the post office. That would make a big difference. I park there every single day and it's like people are all over the place. So that's something we reach out to the owner of the post office about is maybe we could help them come up with a plan. Yeah. And the other thing is, I think the sign with the speed, speed limit sign that flashes, I think it's a good idea. I you think that's actually, something we could you do. You actually hit the brakes. You do. You You're like, oh no, I'm going 45. I should be well, going 25. Yeah, you do. Yeah. So um, I'm going to thank you for coming in. We do have to move to our next item and we've got a couple of things that we can work on. All right. Thank you. Guys so thank you. Time. So yep. just in terms of being following up on this, should we say that we'll revisit this question in a month I, I or think so? we have a couple of action items that we could work on. Yep. One is reach out to the owner of the post office and think about a parking plan. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is what does it cost to put those signs in? Okay. And can mm -hmm. we do that with this uh, permission of the state or the state? Yep. You know, Okay, so and I who think do we want to do those? As far as reaching out to the state? Uh, sure. Uh, well, we get to reach out to John Kaplan, right? Yeah. So we can do so that. Ask Gina to yeah. do that? Okay. Yeah. And in terms of um, talking to the owner of the post office, John is that Kaplan's something? going to be retiring, I think, or moving on, I think, soon. Well, we'll have to talk to him okay. or his replacement. Okay. And uh, we can reach out to the owner of the post office. Maybe you can, or uh, yeah, I can, I, I can, know, guess. Yeah. What's that? I don't know who that is. I can find that. Yeah. I can okay. That. Yeah. I'll look into that. Yeah. Okay. You. Okay. Sounds good. Very Thank good. you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So the next thing on our agenda item is discuss East Montpelier Elementary School traffic management. So um, is everyone aware of the issue or up, up by Vincent Flats mm -hmm. on the parking by the school? The pickup. Time, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I would like somebody to walk me through it. I'm a little bit more confused than I was last time okay. having read the email correspondence that was okay. prepared for us. So well, let, let me just yeah. this is a quick overlay and then everyone else can jump in on it. Um, at a certain time of day in the morning, is it the morning too? It's mostly afternoon. Mostly afternoon. Parents pick up their kids at the school, elementary school. They park. If you're going by the school, going north, they park by the school left-hand side. They're headed this way. Is that correct? They're usually headed south. Mm -hmm. And they're parked on the school side of the road. Mm -hmm. And they usually go from the corner almost to the rec field. Mm -hmm. 
one line of cars. Mm -hmm. And um, the issue is that when trucks come through Fairmont Farm or trucks are going to Fairmont Farm, they're usually big trucks, big manure trucks. They're going by all these parked cars by the side of the road. And um, there's letters in here from the drivers, from the grain company, from everybody that goes by there. And they're concerned about the safety. Uh, they don't want to run into somebody because it's only a lane wide. Mm -hmm. It's a lane and a half, actually. But when you have a big truck, that's all the, that's a lot of, you're taking up a lot of that room. Mm -hmm. And when people open their cars, they don't pay attention sometimes when the truck's coming along or a tractor's coming along and there's a kid there getting in the car or there's a parent opening the door. They don't always pay attention when they open the door. So this is becoming an issue. Now, the principal of the school did have a safety audit done September 13th. She's pushed back and said, we earned the gold standard for safety. She didn't think it was an issue at that point. Uh, but all the other people concerned that drive by there do think it's a safety issue. And what I don't understand is um, when the, the kids come out of the school, mm -hmm. is, is it when they see their car right in front of the school? No. Or do they walk to the road and walk along the line of cars looking for their no, no, they, How do they now, do now this is the process that i understand that's supposed to happen mm -hmm. i'm not sure it's always followed they're supposed to radio in the school is johnny ready to come out to my car and there's radio contact then they send the kid out to the, to the car so when is that radio, radio so for the record yeah. could you introduce yourself uh, i'm bonnie hall mm -hmm. one of the owners of fairmont um been an east montpelier resident since 1987 um had three kids go through elementary school we have two grandkids there now three more coming in the fall so i'm all about keeping the school safe um but what's happening for us as a as a business past the school is um when you're coming from our farm so coming south coming south when you are coming um that's Dodge Road there, we're at Wise, and you've got the four corner school over here on your left. As you're coming around that corner, it's kind of a blind corner, and that's typically where the, the line ends for school pickup. So what happens is that line gradually gets longer as parents get there, and parents do get there <laughs> about three o'clock, even though school doesn't get out until 3.35. So that line continues to build and usually gets right up to that Y. And as they radio in for your kid, um, you know, you're going through the circle in the school. But what happens is because parents are in that line for so long, they are getting out of their cars and chatting with each other. Sometimes they're getting their dogs out. Um, but even if they did stay in their cars, it just, the visibility is very limited because it's such a stretch. So you've got cars coming from Dudley's area and you've got cars, trucks, whatever it may be, neither one is safe, headed to the school. And, you know, it's kind of like playing chicken, you know, do, do I dare go buy these cars? And then you've got somebody there waiting and, you know, you know, can I get by them fast enough because somebody else is coming? I mean, it's, it's a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. And certainly when we add our trucks and our tractors, which will be in April and all of our drivers are well aware of the situation. We talk about it every single day. Um, but you know, it's our grain trucks, it's our milk truck. The milk truck comes right at that same time every day. Nothing we can do about it. And, um, you know, he's got some real concerns. So I don't know, I, they're talking about potentially using the rec field for that parent parking and then making a walkway to the school, which sounds like a great solution. Um, when I kind of discussed it with the principal, it didn't seem that there was much urgency to make that happen. And um, I think for the safety of the community and the safety of the people in those cars waiting, as well as the people driving back and forth, it, it is a fairly urgent matter. So how long each school day does 
does this line of cars occur? You say it's starting as early as three? It starts as early as three. And it goes until? It goes until about 3.40. Okay. Because um, school lets out about 3.35. Mm -hmm. So by the time, you know, those cars are dwindled down, it's about 40 minutes. Okay. Yeah. And, and also the, the other traffic thing that's odd. So if you're coming from Dudley's up to get your kid at school, you have to go up and do a little U-turn right there to join mm -hmm. the line. Right. You know. And then um, south. Yeah. I'm going south. And, and that's yeah. that's kind of a awkward, unsafe thing to do too when you're coming down from Dodge Road. So, so the other question is: Do you think the there's been an increased use of that people hauling <clears throat> their kids to school and back? Well, you know this happened when COVID happened and yeah. obviously there are reasons that it needed to become the way it is, but, um, Oh, definitely. Yeah. There's that's a right. lot more people picking kids up. Right. Um, less, less use of the bus, less use of the bus. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. doubt about that. Yeah. So I, I was wondering if there was some way that we, that parents could be encouraged to let the kids use the bus more though. I know there's times where they need to pick up their kids, but it seems like a, a little gentle persuasion and using the bus a little more might be better for a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't mitigate the parking or some of us don't like the word parking in that situation, but I would call it parking alongside the road. Right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, one of the solutions, I mean, I was hoping the principal would. The, prin the principal's here. Oh. She's on Zoom. Okay would attend because I, I don't know, um, is she buying into the fact that it, it's kind of an issue? Are you buying into that? Where is the principal? Hi, this is Alicia, I'm here. Hi Alicia. Um, so I know that you did the safety audit in September 13th and et cetera, et cetera, but are you thinking that this is an issue that we could work on? I absolutely understand it's a traffic issue for the for the farm and the larger vehicles. When the sheriff's department and um, others came to look at it, they felt and shared, and I think um, they might have even talked with Gina and spent some time at the town office. They shared that they believe this is the safest way to dismiss students at the end of the day. The, the tricky thing is, is we do have more parents that's not something that I'm comfortable telling parents. There's a lot of reasons why parents pick up their children at the end of the day, and, and it's not my place to tell them to put their child on a bus. I feel like that's a personal decision each family needs to make. Um, you know, the bus is, is there for those that want to use it, and the vast majority of our students do ride the bus, but we do have a lot of pickups, and um, so that's just one thing. I understand that it it is as far as traffic going around the corner. An issue, a couple of things that the sheriffs had shared with us, similar to the last conversation that I was just listening to, could there get be signage put up that says there's a school zone? A lot of schools around the state have signage and it says between this time and this time, speed limit 25 miles an hour or slow down school zone. And there is no signage leading up to the school on either side of the road. That was something that the sheriffs had recommended. And I also know, and I know this is not popular and it's not something that, that even I want to explore, but I do know after reaching out to a lot of other schools in the state, they closed their roads during pickup and dismissal and just stopped traffic altogether during that period of time because of safety issues. I don't think that's a good solution. I understand that that, um, like Bonnie was saying, she does not have control over when the milk trucks come, and I, I totally get that. Um, just one clarifier, Seth, we don't send children out into the road at all. Guthrie is one of our parent pickups, and I think he can attest to the fact that we only dismiss them right to the, from the sidewalk into the passenger door right in the pickup circle because oh, we see. don't, yeah. we don't want to go in the circle to pick them up. Yes. And yep. so parents open their doors in the line of traffic. They're just getting out of their cars because they get tired of sitting there or whatever. Yep. I don't know. I, maybe in nice weather that happens. I don't see that happening. Um, I haven't seen it in winter months. May, I have seen it in the pickup circle, but I don't. I can't speak to that happening up the road. I do think a, a solution could certainly be looking at the wreck. Um, 
We don't maintain the rec parking lot. We maintain our parking lot. So it would be a matter of plowing and sanding and maintaining it. That's not, I mean, I think that's something we could certainly have a conversation with you about. I think in when the weather is good and it doesn't need to be maintained, I would be happy to ask families as an alternative to picking up their child at the sidewalk to park at the rec and walk up and meet their children. In the past, any time that the school has ever used the, the rec parking lot, we've always asked permission and it's been a one-off thing. So I think this would have to be a different kind of a relationship. Okay, so just speaking from my perspective, the solution would seem to include the rec parking, rec field parking, have the cars park there. And then the path, I, I think that the path would need some upgrades to sustain that kind of traffic. Uh, pedestrian there traffic. is no path right now. It's, I mean, there's, there's grass, but there's no gravel yeah. or there's no designated path. Yeah. The only, the other thing that I would advocate, but I'm not sure this is going to go over very well, is if there was signs there that said no parking alongside that stretch of road. So I don't no know where you are. Can you tell me where would you want parents to go? I'd want them to park at the, either the rec parking area or the school parking area, not parking in the road. That's, we, that's, that's the best, that's the safest solution from my point of view, but I'm just putting that out there. I think there's two issues with that. Right now, there is no parking. If, if you've ever been to the staff parking lot, it is full. Um, there is no parking available. Yeah. And there isn't enough parking. I know I know a lot of you have had children that go through East Montpelier. When we have an event or there's something at the school, there is no yeah. avoiding parking on the road. The red yeah. parking lot would not hold all of the cars sure. at either dismissal or for an event. Right, that's true. Yeah, when there's an event at the school, there's no place to park. It, it seems to me that um, I guess we could count the cars sometimes. I would think for dismissal, there would be room in the rec field. I think so. No, what about widening the shoulder of the road? So there was just actually more physical room for vehicles to pass each other. What do you think of that, Doctor? I think yeah. if you're going to widen the shoulder of the road, it would only be to the teacher's parking lot. I can't picture going up that onto Parker's land at all. I can't go upside right away. There would be flooding issues right. too. 50 foot right away. Yeah. It's a 24 foot travel lane. So you've got 50, you've got 25 feet. On one side, on each side. It's, it's, not, identif it's not identified where the, where the traveled way is in the right of way. Even if it's in the middle, you have There would be drainage issues there. There's a big culvert that comes underneath there that drains from the um, parking lot, the teacher's parking lot. Judith does her hand up. Yeah, some, oh, yeah, Judith. Hi, um, thank you um, both for coming in. Um, I have a question for um, Ms. Lyford, the, the principal. I was curious about the use of the term um, audit this fall. Um, we just had a discussion with an accountant and the word audit can mean different things in different contexts. So what, what exactly was that audit and what did it consist of? And were there actually cars parked along the road on the day when folk were there? How many cars were there? How long were people there? What, what, did, what did the audit consist of? Sure, so I reached out at the beginning of the school year. As Bonnie shared, this is our third school year with this practice. And because I don't wanna say COVID is over, but a lot of our procedures changed this school year in regards to COVID. We were trying to figure out, do we go back to pre-COVID practices for dismissal, which was, as Bonnie shared, parking along the side of the road, getting out of the vehicles, physically walking to the school, and then walking children back out to the road. Um, coming into the school building, or do we stick with the procedures we've had for the last two years? So I reached out to the Vermont State Police. I reached out to the town administrator, I, to Rosie and Gina, and um, reached out to the Washington County Sheriffs. And what 
what I was told was the best people to come would be the sheriffs because they are the most um, skilled in dealing with traffic issues. And so we had several sheriffs come out over several days. It was over the course of that week of the 13th. They observed from both up the road as well as right from the building. So where Bonnie was describing the why, they sat for several days at drop off in the morning and also at dismissal. They watched the exact flow of traffic that you'll see on any given day, um, both morning and afternoon. And then they came and met with us. And I believe they also went and spent time with Gina at the town office, sharing their findings with us. And, and what they concluded was, what our practice is, is the safest practice for school dismissal and arrival. So for that reason, we, we kept the, the procedures the same. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, approximately how many cars per afternoon are waiting in that queue? I have not counted them and I think it depends, um, but I would say, I would say somewhere around between 20 and 30 would be my guess. And if in Guthrie shake nodding his head. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking that's about right. I agree with you. I was right. gonna say 25 would be a fair number, anywhere from 20 to 30. And, and just one last thing, you had talked about not wanting to impose upon parents the requirement to take the bus, there are a number of reasons why parents might want, need to or want to pick up or drive their kids to or from school. But I was wondering if school doesn't let out until around 3.30, if, if the school would be receptive to recommending, asking, suggesting, whatever, that parents not join, start a line or don't come to the school before 3.15, 3.20, so that the time during which there is this long line um, is shorter as opposed to it being, you know, 40 to 45 minutes in the afternoon. I don't know, I, we haven't tried that, so I can't say for sure, but I don't know that that would make a difference because 20 to 30 cars, regardless of the, the window of time, it does astonish me some days that people have that much time to sit in their car and I'm, you know, I wish I had that amount of time in the middle of the day. I don't, I, I haven't asked them why. I don't know why. I haven't asked them to change their practice. I think some just really enjoy getting to the school early. If any of you have been to the U32 dismissal, it looks very much the same. Um, and it's the same period of time. They just have a larger parking lot. And so the cars, they're backed up Gallison Hill. It is, a, it's a similar practice. Um, I don't know each individual family's reasons for what time they get there. But but they can't pick their child up before dismissal, right? So, so uh, dismissal starts at 325. Okay. 325 and by 335, the buses are gone. And that's typically when our last cars are coming through. So for us, you know, when Bonnie described it, there are cars that get there as early as three o'clock, again, for lots of personal reasons. Dismissal itself takes about 10 minutes. It starts at 325 on the dot every day. We come on the radio, let the teachers know they can dismiss that the buses have arrived. That's when the radio starts calling. And from 325 to 335 is when it's active dismissal. So there's a, there's a couple different things that we could do. One is we could open up the rec uh, area of parking to the school. Is that... Is, are you amenable to that thought? Opening up the rec area parking. Can I Who are you talking to? I was just Who? asking Alicia if that was going to. Oh, what's that? So what I mean, these are parents picking up kids in their cars who mm -hmm. drive to the school, right, and pick up their kids, and yep. the staff parking lot's full. So why would help? Why would opening up the rec parking lot help? It's because then they would then they're not parking the road. Yeah, but they're not getting out of their cars. Yes, they are. So that's, having, that's the problem. So yeah. you're having them wait on the other side of the building and then go hundreds of yards back to the school to pick up their child? Or their child. And they, the or they can walk. Cool. They can walk. They can walk, right. Okay. <laughs> but you need a path. 
between the school. And I the guess there is sort of a marked area that they There's do. two paths. Yeah, there's two paths there, but they, at certain times of year, you'd probably want to put some gravel down or something so it would dry. I'm just trying to think of how to get the cars out. No, of no, no. I, I just. So that's one. Understand. That's one thought. The other thing is that the Kings live across the road. There is an area there that could be used for parking if it was upgraded. Maybe the school could lease that area there and put cars over there for parking. The Kings have the house right across the road. They actually sold it to the halls. Oh, they did sell that house. Oh, okay, so I guess that's not an option. <laughs> yes. I picked up my kids' uh, children, my grandchildren. Could you introduce yourself, Mary? Uh, Mary Stone. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm amazed at how well that system works. I wonder if people could be advised if they were going to arrive before 315 that they park in the rec area um, and then get in line because the line works. Um, and nobody has to cross the road. The problem with trying to park in the rec area, then going out into the road and coming back into the pickup area, just I think would create more problems. So they can't walk though from the I school think, to the rec area? I think that was the idea, if you park in the rec area. The but in the winter, I, I just imagine the parents aren't gonna get out of the car and go get their kid and come school. back. I, I don't imagine that will happen. But if they want to get there early and have conversation, that would be the place to park. Where? In the rec area? At the rec area. Well, that's yeah. what I'm thinking. But then they'd have to get back, back to the cross. Back if they walk, they, they could walk. walk. The kids could walk. I mean, they could. Is it going to hurt them to walk across the lawn? Wait, what yeah, but you know, if you dress up for work that. and it's seven degrees, no, you're probably not, not going to walk. I used to walk to school I'm up sure. both ways. Yeah. Okay, okay, wait a minute. Degrees. So did I. Okay, <laughs> okay. so the discussion, we're getting way into our next discussion. So we got to come to the conclusion. Could, could I ask, I'm sorry, may I ask um, yeah. the principal a question? Um, yes. it, are you required to physically either hand off the child to a parent or put on a bus? So having a student walk by themselves across the path to the rec parking lot, that, that would not work? Second. No, yeah. we would not because we wouldn't be dismissing them to anyone. We would, yeah. we would ask, Seth, you had asked just a minute ago, would I be amenable to parking in the rec? Absolutely. Okay. Under certain conditions, one being that families would have to, parents would have to come up. We would have to physically unite the child with the parent we would not just send them off school property in hopes that they find the right car. We have little, very little ones, three and four year olds. Second is I would be absolutely open to using the rec for parking. I think that would be a great solution, but I do know that there will still be families who, as the grandmother mentioned, won't get out of their vehicle. Again, lots of good reasons why, and will still need to use that pickup um, that we have right now. Well, if we can start getting some of the cars out of the road and parked in the rec area, that'll at least help, right? One, there won't be so many cars parked along the road. I shorten can't the line. imagine if there's, a, if there's an option, I can't imagine anybody's going to park at the rec field. Yeah. One of the solutions that we've talked about is putting up no parking signs, and we've discussed the disadvantages of it. Um, but if, um, you know, if dismissal is at 325, and a problem is the length of time that cars are there, then we could perhaps amend our ordinance and put up no parking signs going up until like 315, no parking from, I don't know, 230 to 315 on school days. Uh, Alicia. I'm sorry, that won't work. We because we have a lot of like a concert at the end of the day or parents okay. come in for like we, our building okay. is open to families all day. Yep. So uh, you and you have things that have so many cars that people need to park on the road during the day. Okay, so that's, there's actually more cars parked when there's an event than there is for the dismissal. I was thinking I of after. I was home. thinking of after school events. No, I think no, winding yeah. the roads is a better idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I actually do. That's why I wanted everybody to be here so we'd get this information. I like widening the road, but I know there's physical physical limitations to that. But still, you could get gain a lane. Um, anyway. I would, I would, I just wanted to voice my support for, you know, pursuing these other options, but I think that we should have 
a school safety zone. I think that makes, I, I didn't appreciate that there wasn't signage saying school zone, um, you know, certain 25 miles an hour or whatever it is between this time and that time. I think that makes sense regardless of what we're doing with parking. I think that we should do that. And I think that we should explore pursuing that. So. Yeah, that that's not gonna take care of the actually safety issue because the drivers that are going by there already know it's a problem. Mm. Yeah. But, but anyway, I, I think, it's, it's not a bad I idea. It, I think yeah. it's actually a, a prudent idea and a responsible idea to do to promote the safety of the students and also the people who are, you know, going in and out of the school during, you know, pick up and drop off time. So uh, I appreciate that it may be a, a separate issue, but it has come up um, that um, the principal has identified it as a need or a desire. And I think it makes perfect sense. And I think you know, we might be an outlier of not having a, you know, a, an identified school zone. So I think we should be pursuing that. Okay, we pursue that. Sounds good. Is anybody for designating <laughs> or giving the school permission to park cars down by the rec field? Can I just state one thing about that? I pick up my grandkids and already park at the rec field at, or at the old schoolhouse and walk down and get them only because they're young and, and they prefer to walk um, and be outside. So I know that um, many parents may like that idea as well. So I think the rec field is a really good option to help with the parking issue. Yeah. What are you okay. looking for a motion? I think we should, should make a motion if everyone <clears throat> feels comfortable with that and at least get a little piece of the puzzle solved to so, some extent. So it's it not going to solve the whole thing. It would be the town offering the rec field parking. Yeah. Is Guthrie still on the line? <clears throat> to me, it looks like it's always been plowed. No. So I didn't know what no? the issue okay. was. It was plowed when I drove by. I it's just, always plowed? Uh, I, it's just a uh, single road. Yeah, it's okay. plowed for traffic to drive through. So we'd have to do a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, so that I mean, would just yeah. be something to clarify with Guthrie. Well, we right. can check with Guthrie. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a good option. If we, we may need to make some more improvements in that parking because it may mm -hmm. need more gravel, et cetera, et cetera. Right. right. I right. think that the town could do that. It's a viable option. And it's, we can help out with the path. And we can help out with the path also, because I think the path the school. would eventually need um, gravel, which means putting down some fabric, putting some gravel, the town could help with that. And I think that's gonna alleviate some of the parking problems. I, it's not a solution to everything, but it could help. And it's within our power to do that also. Okay, yeah. so no, no signage other than school zone signage. Well, school zone signage is a good idea. I don't know what other signage we could put there. I'm, I advocate for signage myself. No parking, but that's not going to really work because they need that. Yeah. The other thing is widening the road in certain areas would definitely help. It would help. And the town has a 50 foot right of way through there. We're using 24 feet of that. So we've got 12 feet either side that we could work with. If it was wider, it would help. So and no U turn sign might to help too. <laughs> What's that? Let's bring Guthrie in for further discussion. Yeah, but I think we've already got. How about um, let's get a motion to say we could use that parking area by the rec field. I don't want to vote on that without talking to the road board. You can make it contingent on talking to them. Uh, let, let's just invite him back for next meeting. Well, I'd rather have some action myself if no one feels comfortable. I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion that we that the town offer up the parking area at the rec field for at, for <laughs> after school parking. For no, just say school parking. For school parking, um, and and also help the school with developing a, a, a walkable path up to the school, improving the path, improving the path, and that we keep it maintained, and we do so. Um, we that contingent, contingent on on a positive um, response from the uh, road corner. I, I'd want to have an idea how much that's going to cost, how much improvements we're going to need to make in the rec field to have it used. Every day. That's contingent on what. Yeah. So. The road form is let's, so let's, I think we let's talk to the motion, and then if there's if there's a problem with cost and everything, then we can we we won't do it. So, I I, I will vote against that. Okay. We have Could I? I'm sorry. Can I? Um. I, I apologize, but one one other question might be, 
And I don't think it's a question for Guthrie. It might be for us to look at our own insurance policies. If we're, if folks, if we're allowing use of the um, rec field and we're developing and maintaining a path, um, and if we're, gonna we're not going to maintain the path. path. Okay, because I thought and you said maintain. Gravel for that I thought path. you said maintain. You, I thought you said maintain in your motion. Um, maintain. Uh, you did the, say that. We already do that though. Well, I would draw the maintaining part of it. But but we're going to maintain the parking area because we already do. Right. Yeah. And and the school already uses it for phys physical education. The kids are down there playing soccer. There's parents there. There's games there. It's already used by the school. Yeah. It's already insurance there. Okay. I just you're putting you're you're creating a motion that we will be maintaining it. So I, I think I'm, I'm in favor of this. I'm just I, I'm withdrawing the maintaining. Okay. We'll make it available. <laughs> make it available. We already maintain it. We already maintain it. <laughs> okay. We do. We okay, we have another comment here. Mary, so again. Yep. I also want to point out that it's there's a big distance between the dismissal area and the property line where so the path would have to go through the snow through the playing fields where they play soccer and you know it's it's a big area that we're talking about yards. that has to be kept clear of snow in the winter for kids to walk well, who clears the road who clears the parking lots for the school but it's not i, I mean you have to walk it's across grass. fields where they can say something say I, I will note that the school already uses that area all the time. So the snow is in consistent use and they're playing out there during the day. Yeah, there's a path already there. It's yeah, just right. not a gravel path. Right. Yeah. It could be right along the fence. Right it's along, along the, the fence, fence. right. Right. It wouldn't yeah. interfere with the fields. So. Okay, so we have a motion. The motion says will we allow the school to use the rec. Uh, Parking area for <clears throat> parking. Continue on Guthrie's favorable opinion of this. As far as keeping it plowed, he already plows it. It's just not widened. It's plowed all the time. They they take a couple passes through it. Okay, so I'll what would be? I'll second. Okay, Amy seconds it. Um, any further discussion? Yeah, I'll just say that I think that's not right for us to decide this right now. I think we need to talk about it a little bit more, get input from Guthrie. It's not a simple black and white, yes or no, favorable or unfavorable from him. I'd like to know the cost to the town of doing something like this. I, I like the idea. I'd like to know more about it before we vote on it. All right. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 We have four ayes. All those opposed, please say nay. Nay. And we have one nay. Okay. Well, we made a little progress on it. So um, we're going to have to move to the next item and we'll work on some more ideas for this issue. I'm glad everyone could attend and um, we had a lot of feedback. Thanks a lot. Thank yep. you. Thanks for coming in, everyone. Yep. Thank you, Alicia. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so we've done with that. Discuss proposal to close County Road for recreation events. We've got a lot of people here. What is could, could we could we get a sense of could you show the gallery view so we get a sense of who all is on the Zoom call too? Or that's oh, I thought they're already yeah. up there. Now um, we do have a lot of people here, but have they all signed in? Do we have people signed in? There's a, there's a sign in sheet right there. It's always nice for us to know who put in his hands. Um, okay, so I think everyone's um, familiar with the proposal. There's an applicant has come in, wanted to close the county road for six times during the year. Um, we've also gotten a lot of feedback. The feedback is generally been negative. 69% no, 27% yes. What's that? 69% no, 27%. Okay, 69% yes. no, 27 yes. 4% that kind of undecided. Yeah. Okay. I've had some calls, all the calls were negative. Um, so I'm leaning towards denying the nine. Good feedback from myself. the LCT as well. Um, yeah, on this and, the, and liability for the town. Essentially their recommendation is that if we were to pursue this, yeah. it needed to be a town managed event. Yeah. Could okay. we ask Larry to represent the idea so that we all have fresh 
view of it and so that that's in the record and also any conversations that you've had with people since the last time would you begin introducing yourself sure i'm larry gilbert i live on the county road um my harebrained idea to do this um uh, so the proposal is as uh, as seth mentioned close county road six times second sunday of every month may through uh october three hours nine to noon um for 2.1 miles from barnes road to templeton road and the purpose of doing that would be to allow pedestrians and bicyclists and skiers and rollerbladers and non-motorized um, activities uh, along along the road in an effort to build community and um, just have a great place to go out and get some exercise and recreate and be outdoors and meet neighbors. Um, the um, if, I, if I could just quickly address a couple of uh, objections uh, that have have come up that that might be relevant to, to, to your thinking. So the stretch between um, Barnes Road and Templeton Road is 2.1 miles. Uh, if you detour around, if, in other words, if the road was closed at that point and you drove down Barnes and took a left on Center Road and down to Templeton Road and back out to County Road, that's 4.1 miles. So um, the inconvenience for somebody would be 2.1 miles. They'd have to drive that much farther uh, on a detour. Um, I drove it the other day. The paved road took me um, three minutes to drive. The, the detour took me nine minutes to ride drive so six minutes so 2.1 miles and six minutes of inconvenience is what is what we're asking for um in in a month um there are 700 odd hours 24 times 30 um i don't have the number right in front of me we're proposing that it be closed for three hours in a month that's less than one percent of the time so hardly seems like um, a, a, a huge a, a huge ask. Um, the reason we're here today, or one reason we're here today is because when you gave us permission to close the road in November, we had a really um, positive response. Uh, a lot of people uh, stopped us and said, um, are you gonna do this again? When are you gonna do this again? So we, um, we feel that there is support out there in the community, in the East Montpelier community, as well as the broader community, uh, that this could be a really fun, cool, interesting, safe activity. So um, with that, I can answer questions. And you have uh, cut, conversed, I understand, with folks from the Complete Streets uh, in Montpelier. Uh, we've talked about getting Callis residents involved in this. Why, why did you ask or why did Montpelier uh, residents get interested in this discussion? So I originally started talking with Nancy Schultz, who is the um, uh, director of the Complete Streets program in Montpelier because she showed up at our November event and was uh, wowed and thought it was, thought it was great. And she's been trying to do similar kinds of efforts uh, in Montpelier uh, without success. And so she wanted to support our activities <clears throat> thinking that maybe it would be contagious and, uh, and uh, spread, spread to other locales. So there's other folks here that probably like to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so let's we'll start with you. Yeah, I'm wondering, sorry, if you could, ahead. yeah. I'm wondering if you can go into a little bit more detail about the safety aspect. You said that it would be a safe event. So, um, you know, one of the concerns that we've heard from residents and those who have commented it is the concern about safety um, and the um, BLCT was concerned about some liability issues. So how do we, how, what's the proposal to ensure that um, folks you know, that it would remain closed, that folks who live in that stretch or on that stretch can access it 
um, that if there's an emergency, emergency crews can go through um, having flaggers. What, what's the safety plan or protocol that you're proposing? So um, we can't guarantee safety, obviously, um, but um, um, when we when we did this in November, um, we had we had the road blocked and signs up uh, provided by the town of East Montpelier. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we had a, a state police trooper parked at one end down at the at the at the uh, southern end of the thing, and um, I think that that um, that visual allowed uh, or enabled helped people to understand that this was a place where they had to had to drive cautiously if they had to, if they had to go through additionally there was cones um, all, along the entire stretch uh, right down the middle of the road and so any of the local traffic was um, the the visual signal was for it to it was to drive uh, very slowly um, uh, what we had we hope to do if given approval is to um, so this is the the closure will be to through traffic the the local traffic will still be allowed to drive uh, on the road um, and what we would hope to do uh, if given approval is to reach out to that that that's that two mile stretch of residents and um, uh, tell them what we're planning to do and and ask for their cooperation and driving cautiously if they have to use the, the road at that, at that time. As far as ambulances, of course, they could come through at any time as as needed. Anybody that's being that's using the road as a pedestrian or a biker would be told that the road would be uh, not completely car free, but mostly car free. So um, that's what we're thinking about. Okay, I'd like to move on to the residents. Yes. I'm Gerald Rose. I live in this section. You're talking about closing. Um, uh, the term road indicates by dictionary as motorized traffic. Uh, if I would suggest that we were to remove all pedestrians and bicycles from the road for a certain amount of time, there would be an outcry about how they have a right to use it. It is a roadway, it's meant to be driven on. I understand that. Two or three hours is a uh, uh, easy ask. Uh, it's not an easy ask for people, who, everybody who pays taxes to use that road within a certain amount of time frame. I'm sorry, your taxes cannot be used at this particular time because we would like to recreate on that property that is paid for by everybody. You can say you can make an argument that everybody can go use it, but maybe some people don't want their time or their money used towards that or their, their road is inaccessible at that particular time. You're saying that traffic people could go, like my property, I can go through, get in and out, I have to weave around people. I had a person last time come to my house and ask me to use tools because there was some problem with his bike. I'm like, I'm like, who the heck is this guy? And he just asked me to use stuff on my property now because he felt like, oh, half and I just need using tools, what's the big deal? No, you stay off my property, don't come up here. I don't want you, I'm not even near the road, I'm way away from the road. You went out of your way to go do this. I don't want people on the road. They can ride the bikes on the road. Absolutely. They can ride their walk on the road any day of the week. They can do that. Is it safe? Absolutely not. I would never advocate bicycling or walking on that road during regular traffic, especially since the road's been improved now. I suspect that there's a lot of uh, uh, speeding issue, a lot of complaints on that I road. I've not got many calls. Many calls. I, it's I, a force, that's an enforcement issue. They're going to come in the summer. Well. But I yes. found out items like this are very uh, uh, politically, they're politically, they're emotional, or they're financial. Who can benefit from this financially by having this road closed? Uh, more farm made, they park all down there, ride their bikes. He can make money off of that. Somebody who sells bicycles can make money off of that. Anybody can make money off of that. As, as, a, as they can use it as a, uh, um, we like to do this. I understand we like a lot of things, but that particular sector, it's a roadway. It's made for traffic. It's paid for, it's paid. It's what it's made for. We have a bicycle pass. I can't go driving on that because nobody's using it anymore because they're driving on my road. I can't go on bike paths. I can't go, I have to, everything has a designation. This is a road, public thoroughfare, which means every public can use it. Automobiles, public. And I just think that, Having our road open, our close, I should say, I thought was really interesting. We're celebrating the opening of the new road by closing it. That doesn't make sense to me. It should be open so people can drive through it, not close so people can recreate on it. When I see bicycles at two in the morning or three in the morning or in rainstorms, snowstorms riding on the road, it's regular traffic. Okay, they're traffic. They can use it. But close their roads. 
people can play on the road and skateboard. There's places for that. I can't go drive anywhere as I want. I only have a certain place I can drive on the road. I design roadways. I do roadways. That's what I do for a living. This is not a place to be having any of that. Not for fun, not closing it down. Okay. So the lady next to you? Yes, hi, I'm Patty Giovara. I also live on that sector road, I'm sorry. Um, and I love getting outside and biking and doing all kinds of things, but I don't think that the road is a recreation path and I don't think it should be closed uh, for the purpose of recreation. And, you know, County Road is, you know, kind of the one way to get out to the ponds and everything else that's happening out in Dallas and Sunday morning would be kind of prime time. So anyway, I'll be brief. I just, I just don't think it's a, a recreation path. Thank you. Mary Stone. Mary Stone. I live on Cummings Road, actually more or less on County Road. And I was within that closed area in November. And my initial thought was, that's really dangerous. I'm not going to let my kids go out there. My grandchildren go out there. Well, when it actually happened, I went down to the mailbox and I looked to the right and I looked to the left and I went, this is amazing. I've got to get on this road. I got my bicycle out of storage and got on the road and rode down. And it was fabulous. There were people out walking. There were people out communicating. People who hadn't, who didn't know each other were walking together, um, smiling. This was everybody who lived and needed to go to Callis or anywhere on County Road all summer had to go around through the beautiful back roads. <laughs> and we were finally given the freedom to, to be on that road. It was, it was so wonderful. I went back to the house and, you know, it was a cold day and it was kind of drizzling. Got the grandchildren out there and said, you've got to experience this. This is this is an exceptional thing that this town has done and the organizers uh, in, in making it happen, but the select board in allowing it to happen. Uh, it was, um, I, all I can say is if you didn't get out and walk on the road, you know, if you had, maybe you'd feel different. It, it really was, was a feeling of community that I had not experienced on um, where I live in East Montpelier. There is no town center, there's no green, there's no gathering place, there's county road. And it, I, I, I would love to see it happen again. Okay. Um, Michelle, what did you want to say? I know, just, I think it's a fantastic idea. We've missed the opportunity when we're widening roads. Um, They're not getting paved for pedestrian or bike travel. Um, that, 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 that's sort of a missed opportunity. We don't have bike paths, uh, at least not that I know of in our town. Um, they're just, they're, they're, it's an extraordinary opportunity to create community and get people outside. It's two or three hours once a month. I mean, I, I just, I, 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 I think it's a fantastic idea. So um, do we have some people that are zooming in that would like to say something about this? Hey, oh, yeah. Phillips. Yeah. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Kate Phillips. I live um, at the corner of County um, in Templeton. So we're uh, right, we're the first house right inside um, the, the closed, the proposed closed area. And um, so there were, um, we were the, uh, there were people, you know, gathered outside of our house where the, um, kind of diagonally outside of our house um, for uh, the volunteers where they were closed. And, you know, we absolutely loved it. Um, we loved looking outside and seeing people um, out and about, um, everyone having a great time, people of all ages on all different, you know, types of, uh, you know, bikes, uh, roller skates, roller skis, roller, roller blades, everything. Um, we loved walking down the road um, and really kind of getting a chance to slow down on a um, stretch that's usually sped through. Um, and I think, um, you know, life in rural Vermont, especially, you know, coming out of a, a global pandemic can be really isolating. And anything that um, we can do to mitigate that um, is huge. And I think also um, anything that we can do to um, discourage 
uh, you know, the total reliance on cars um, and car culture is is a positive thing in my book. Um, you know, this is a very car dependent place and it hasn't always been. We used to have a railroad um, stop in East Montpelier. Um, you know, there's no reason to totally embrace all things cars. And um, I, I just uh, don't think that three hours um, a month is too much to ask. Um, and uh, I think it was a, a really fantastic community building um, moment. And I really want to encourage that. Thank you. Somebody else would like to speak with the Zooming? Yep. Hi, my name is Ann Gilbert, and I live on County Road. And I'm also part of the work group that really um, I participated in the pilot project last November. And I met Kate, I met, I met other neighbors on the road that I never would have seen. And like Mary Stone said, so many people were out there having a really good time. Part of our work group was to really look at, um, you know, uh, what, what, what worked and what didn't work in November. And so some of the things that we came up with that, you know, is in the proposal now is really shortening the distance um, to, you know, um, to have it just be Barnes to Templeton um, and not all the way down blocking Morse Farm or, you know, all the way down to Cummings. Um, also thinking about keeping it on a Sunday morning, but keeping a lot of the things that um, helped make it positive last time, which was the support with signage. Um, there were signs up ahead of time and uh, we put information out on Front Porch Forum. Um, it did come up quickly, but um, I was at one of the roadblocks at County and Templeton. And certainly if people came through and said, I need to be able to get in my driveway, I need to get to my house. I said, okay, you just put your flashes flashers on and drive slowly. And so one of the things our work group decided was we are increase, increasing the number of people who would be volunteers to take shifts to work on this so that there are people all along the way um, in a bright vest who would be able to, um, you know, just help cars if they had to um, get through uh, navigate that. So it's not closed county road, it's really closed to through traffic. And I work in public health and part of what's really important right now, especially like Kate said, coming out of a pandemic is, you know, community involvement and um, especially for families and youth and to see so many kids that were out there with their families or with their friends or with their coaches, it was really an opportunity to um, get outside and have physical activity, um, feel like you were part of something, you know, we don't have rally day anymore. And um, this was really uh, important. And I, you know, I, I would hope that we could work with the town on reaching some kind of compromise of instead of maybe a yes or a no, but like, you know, like, how how could how could this work? How could it be a positive experience? And I'd like to have Nancy Schultz say um, something. She's part of our work group as well. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anybody else that is zooming in want to say something on this issue? Can I yes. add? Oh, this lady down here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. Are you guys directing? Indicating? Yeah, I'm just looking for a comment by by the public and. Yeah. Okay. Well, as as Larry and Ann mentioned, um, I'm Nancy Schultz, and I'm actually I don't direct the Complete Streets program in Montpelier. It's a committee that I'm a, a member of. Um, we rotate who who is chair, and I have been chair, and I'll probably come into the rotation again. But just to be clear, I'm currently a member of the committee, and I did attend the November event. I thought it was fantastic um, for all the reasons that that um, Ann and Larry and Kate and others have mentioned, it was all about community. It was friendly. It involved everybody from dog walkers to people pushing baby strollers and every kind of conveyance other than cars, it seemed. Um, and it's such a rare opportunity to be, on, be in a place like that. I, I ride my bicycle on County Road um, regularly and I found myself that day finding that, oh my goodness, I don't have to keep 
looking in my rear view mirror every half second to see if a car is going to sideswipe me or push me further onto the shoulder. I mean, I ride very conservatively, but people do drive quickly there fast and sometimes too fast. And it was just, it was just really wonderful to enjoy that road um, with all the other people on bikes and on their, on, on their feet um, without having that anxiety that you have when you are in a place with lots of cars. I mean, as Kate mentioned, we're in a car centric society. So to, to get a break every so often and get that pure joy of not having to be fearful is a wonderful thing. Thank you. I think everyone's had a chance to comment on this issue. Turn it over to the select board. So I think uh, Judith, you're concerned about the safety issues and insurance, et cetera. Yeah, just a couple of things. I do, I do appreciate all of the comments and I unfortunately wasn't able to participate, um, but I was struck by um, some of the language used to describe the event. Um, it was exceptional, it's rare. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, uh, there's a proposal that it be, I don't know, five or six um, Sundays in the summer, but you know, I, I do appreciate, and that number to me seems like a lot because of, you know, for some of the reasons that um, the gentleman who lives on County Road had identified, and, and, and the others are that, you know, the, primarily for me, kind of the safety reasons. And I wasn't aware that um, a state trooper had parked um, at one end of the route. And we have very limited state um, police coverage. And I think, you know, if we have to pay or take, take away our time dedicated to the town for um, state police coverage to dedicate to this event, I'm not sure if that's a, a prudent and equitable use of our resource considering or our use of state police funds or time considering all of the people in our town. Um, but I was curious if the group um, and those proponents, you know, would think about, you know, a once a year event. And, and I'm not, I'm just, it, it seems that a five or six times a year for me, because of the disruption to other residents, the concern about the potential safety risks, I appreciate that you're able to um, control for all of that the last time around, but multiplying that by six times, th that's, that's increasing the risk. And that's, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. And I'm just wondering if the group's thought of maybe once a year. Um, and also, you know, whether, you know, have you thought about just other safety concerns like, you know, having training for the volunteers and are you expecting that the volunteers um, you know, have, you know, if they're injured somehow that the town compensates them for their injury. You know, I'm just wondering if those types of things have been thought about, but those are just things that I've been thinking about based upon what you've all been saying. And I do, and I do, it, it sounds, it sounded like a wonderful event and I'm really sorry that I missed it. Um, but I'm wondering if, you know, perhaps um, if it could you know, if maybe it could be um, limited to once a year, um, it's a thought. That's a good compromise thought, um, Carl. Sure, thank you. So I, I appreciate all the interest that, uh, that this proposal has um, has sparked and to appreciate everybody coming here and coming on to the Zoom meeting. Uh, my interest in something like this was first sparked around 1980, whenever it was that the Pope came to Boston. And for security reasons, the highways coming into Boston were all closed down. And all of a sudden these highways that were, you know, usually four lanes, three lanes of cars in each direction, just had people walking and bicycling, skateboarding on them. And it was marvelous. One of my favorite activities in Vermont each year is the New World Festival in Randolph. And they closed down 
the main street in Randolph there, make people detour around town so that uh, people can walk between music venues. They do that for about uh, six hours or 12 hours or so on a Sunday and uh, Labor Day weekend. And you know, the, the street has kids out with chalk, making chalk art and just people dancing in the streets. And uh, it's a completely different atmosphere uh, one, once a year for 12 hours. As a select board member, you know, when I have a decision like this where people are passionate on both sides of it, then I have to think, okay, how should I be thinking about it as a select board member? And I take my guidance from the select board way back in the day when we had just three people on the select board. And there was a meeting called to give town input on this intersection here, Route 14 and, and two, on whether to change the plans from what we ultimately got built to a roundabout. And the, uh, the input to the select board was overwhelmingly in favor of putting in a roundabout instead of an intersection with, with a light on it. The select board voted by a two to one vote to go ahead with the proposed intersection. And that was something that was in the agency's plans. It was quite well developed. The agency told the town we needed, uh, we would go to the back of the queue to get everything re-engineered to get the roundabout. I was disappointed that the select board did not listen to the roundabout people since it was so overwhelmingly in favor of the roundabout. Uh, years later, I was thankful for that because we got this built and maybe it doesn't function quite as well as a roundabout, but I'm very impressed with the way that it functions. And I was told years later that uh, Gene Bissering, one of the people who looked at it uh, and, and uh, proposed and was a proponent of the roundabout said, you know, actually, I'm not sure we have the room for that, but we got something built. And um, rather than going back to the end, end of the queue and that along with the, the bridge over route two was something that was just, had been on the town list of things to do forever because the select board decided by a two to one vote to go ahead and do something that people in town told them not to do, then we got that. And I, I told Martha Holden, who was the, the deciding vote on that years later, that I was really, um, really pleased that, that they voted that way. And so that's what I think. Th I think we need to be visionary and uh, you know, have the guts to do what's right for the town. Um, also, I, in, in looking at the responses that we're getting, uh, some people are responding to a proposal that in, that is different from what was actually made. Uh, some people are responding to a proposal to allow no traffic at all on County Road during these three hours each month. And I could understand why, why they would be upset by it. But as we've heard repeatedly, this is a proposal to close it down to anything but local traffic so that the residents on this stretch would have the possibility of coming and, and going as they see fit or that their visitors would be able to come and go as they see fit. Also, I'm told that it's true in other places that have done things like this, that there's a lot of resistance, like we heard from Mary Stone, people who are, are worried about this. And then once they experience it, uh, then the uh, there's a groundswell of support for it. So uh, a common planning phrase, I'm told, when it comes to shutting down, this is, a, this is different, but analogous, shutting down a street uh, in a business district to car traffic is that people scream twice once uh, the business owners scream twice once when it's proposed and then once when someone proposes to open it up to motor vehicles again. Uh, I, I think that if we do this that and more people in town have a chance to experience it and whether that's better than a, a November gray very gray drizzly November day that uh, we'd also see more support for it. You're done. I am. Okay. <laughs> John? Well, as a person who's been in, in state and town government for 40 years, <clears throat> I know I look too young for that, but um, I, uh, I have concerns about, I mean, I grew up in Vermont. I rode my bike everywhere because you could back then. Um, there weren't any trails or anything. There were just back roads. 
Um, and we, we ride our bikes now on the rail trails and we really like doing that. We enjoy that. But what, uh, what, what really stops me from wanting to approve this project or, or this, this, this proposal is that we need to think about the liability issues to the town. <clears throat> Somebody's injured. Somebody has road rage and goes through there and hits somebody. The people who organize this event are liable personally liable. Okay, so you have to remember that. You may want to get an insurance writer. Two, the town has a deep pocket, so the town would be the final stop in the lawsuit that would occur if somebody was injured here. There are things that you can do that would limit your personal liability would be if you became a volunteer of the town, and then you had to sign off on an agreement that you would do certain things for the town in order to be able to do this. But you have to remember that the town has liability here. Somebody could get hurt here. And do we want to take that liability? There's ways around it so you can kind of avoid some of that liabilities. One being a volunteer of the town, one following through on um, agreeing to certain things you need to do. Like one thing I think you need to be aware of is there has to be, there has to be safety training. You have to understand what it's like to be on the road. You should take flagger training. I mean, that sounds kind of foolish, but that tells you where to position yourselves, what the, what the issues could be, how you could get hurt and that sort of thing. And that's offered by the league and it's offered online and there's some way we could probably arrange to have people take that training. Um, also, I think there should be a couple of sheriffs there. I don't know about the state police, but somebody who is going to organize this thing should work this out so that there's a sheriff at each end so that we have some police officers present if we're gonna be doing this, it shouldn't just be you people. Um, and I think the town should have a policy on this sort of thing. I know that um, when I was town manager in Hardwick, we had every single month a coin drop. The coin drop occurred at, at, in the street, right in front of the fire department. People were in the street, but they had guidelines they had to follow. And we had a policy that outlined everything that they did and they had to follow those policies. Um, and I think that we need some sort of policy like that. If we don't do that, if I can't get an agreement from you folks that you're gonna do that, then I won't vote in favor of it because I'm looking out also for all the taxpayers in town. I, I, so you're saying <clears throat> that you would do <clears throat> policy and also that they would have to participate in safety training? Or are you saying if they participated in safety training, you'd be okay with it? No, I think we have to have a policy just outline what our role is and what their role is. And that the fact that they do need to take safety training yeah. um, and that the, we do need to have some, we should have a couple of sheriffs there. They're the easiest ones to hire and have out there. But that's, I, I believe that's the biggest impact for me. And, and I read a lot of, I read those uh, emails. There's a bunch of emails out there. And I do know there's a lot of people are very concerned about the fact that, that the road would be closed and there might be some issues surrounding that and they just don't like it. So yeah. But the point is, from my point of view, it's exactly what you just said. It's, it's safety awareness training, it's liability issues, and it's having some sort of guidance from the town on how this would happen and who's responsible. And you need to look out for yourselves too, liability-wise. So Amy, thank you, John. Amy? My thinking is very much along the lines of John's. What about the kind of compromise that Judith was talking about once a year? Actually, that's an interesting compromise. It wouldn't have to be once a year. I did think that five or six times a year, you know, right. whatever, not everybody's in favor, but I guess in my thinking was, yeah. is that even going to be really popular or really special if it's just kind of a given at that point? Right. You kind of want to make it rare and unique, I think. Yeah. Um, so... It's a, it's a tough issue. First mm -hmm. of all, we look at the mm -hmm. kind of the survey that was done, I'm just going by the figures, people have called in, 69% of the people are against it, 27 for it. And, you know, the way I like to think of things in the town is we try to do things that benefit the most amount of people. If 69% of the people have called in are against it, that's a red flag to me that there's a lot of people against this. But, you know, I hear a lot of positive uh, feedback from the people that are here tonight. Um, I guess I would lean, if I was going to 
put my two cents into this. I agree with what John is thinking about the safety issues and also uh, Judith has raised the same. Um, you know, I, I would be in favor of the once a year compromise with safety training as mandatory and with the safety of, of police there on either end of the blockade. So you either have the state police or you could have the sheriffs. So the only way I would be in favor of it, it'd be a once a year event. I guess that's what I, my compromise on that. And I don't know uh, what everyone else thinks of that. Would we also consider possibly establishing a committee to manage this? Because one of the LCT's comments was that the town managed this. I would really prefer not to do that mm -hmm. and put that on mm -hmm. my plate. This has already taken an incredible amount of time mm -hmm. just to get right. to this point. So I'd kind of like to be out of County Road for mm -hmm. at least, I don't know, <laughs> two months of my career here. Yeah. It'd be great. <laughs> so yeah. I'd like to have someone else field all of that um, yeah. because I just don't really, frankly, have the time yeah. to plan an event. John articulated very well, and, and you have as well, that um, the concerns that VLCT uh, put out, and uh, for those who haven't seen them, they're available on the, the town website in connection with this, this meeting. And uh, yeah, it, it sounds like to be properly covered. We need to uh, either take it within an existing town committee. I don't know if the, the rec committee is at all interested in this, or we need to create a new committee uh, that, that will hound it. But we sound, it sounds like we have a working group working on it already. Uh, Larry, do you think the members of the working group would be amenable to being appointed as town committee members? So um, I can't speak for the group. Sure. Just, just one. Sure. Um, um, I guess I guess I would um, ask you to vote on the proposal in front of you, yeah. yes or no, and then if there's uh, a desire on your part to say, if you vote no on this, um, but go ahead and do it one time, if that's something that you're proposing, then we'd have to go back and say, well, do we want to? We want to put in the effort to make this happen at one time or um or not and right. i mean I, i'm sure that the training would be would be great i don't think anybody would object to that um, having it under the town umbrella i think would be fine i don't see any reason why that would be a bad idea um but um we came to you with a specific proposal and we'd like you to vote on that and your proposal is 600 correct yeah I think you need somebody to make that motion. And that would be the first step in voting on. Mm -hmm. So I'm not in a position to make a uh, make a motion as the chairman. Yeah, I, I hear the request and um, I, I don't hear the level of support for six times a year right now. And rather than proposing something that would get voted down, I don't think, you know, if we're gonna split this I don't think that one is halfway in between six and zero. Um, I, I would propose that we try it for this coming year. It'd be a one-time thing. And we make it contingent on the committee and uh, working with the, the town to satisfy our insurers' concerns about this. So it would be contingent on committee coming back at a future date saying, okay, here, here are how the concerns uh, that have been laid out and here's how we are satisfying them. And maybe it means we make some appointments at that time. Maybe it means something else. I, I think we need to figure that out. But um, I'd be willing to make a motion to, um, ex to um, accept the proposal to close down County Road three times a year, recognizing that that's not exactly the proposal coming from the committee on, on a Sunday for three hours uh, between 9 and 12 a.m. If, if that's something that I could get a second from, and again, contingent on us working out the details of the, um, of the coverage. Well, that's changing their proposal to three. That's correct. Right. And it's also changing it by saying it's contingent on us working out the details of the coverage. They, they asked for a blank check to do that. And I don't think under any circumstances we should give that because we have good concerns about right. I think you liability. also have to designate somebody that's going to be a point person besides our town administrator on this issue. Sure. Because she's like swamped with it and doesn't want to be swamped with it. Sure. So, sure. Uh, but but 
Yeah, so I'd be willing I, to take that you, on. I so. mean, you're going to have to ask this gentleman here whether he's happy with the three times, and I don't think you've got the support from the psych board to vote on that uh, mm -hmm. affirmatively. So, what do you think, Mr. Gilbert? Um, <laughs> okay, we'll take three. If you want to vote, if you want to vote yes for three, I uh, will. We'll we'll take it as a start. Well, I'm not saying I'm voting yes. I, just, I understand yeah. that, but if 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 you want to amend it to three <clears> and see <throat> if it passes, then I guess that's. Uh, <laughs> Okay. I'd be curious to see how that goes. It does appear that six is not going well, to he, he's made. He's going to make a motion, Carl. Mm -hmm. He's making a motion. We don't have a second for it yet. We'll see what happens. That's okay. correct. Yeah. All right. So now you're looking for a second. I am. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is contingent on everything being favorable, all the stars lining up, and you know, it turns out that it's not. I will second that then. Okay. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Well, you asked for more discussion first. Oh, yeah. no, I'm not going to ask for more discussion. <laughs> and after nine, we have a lot of other stuff to do. So, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 You've got two ayes. Is that correct? All those opposed, please say nay. No. Okay, the motion is voted down. So now, I think the ball is in. Mr. Gilbert's court. Appreciate you taking all this time tonight and all the work that's gone into it up until this. I honestly didn't think it was going to create uh, <laughs> this, this much work for anybody. Right. Um, seemed like a simple proposal to me. Um, we'll circle back and maybe you'll see us again with something new. Yeah, the thing about um, you coming back in contact, it'd be nice if we didn't overwhelm our town administrator with this task. So. I think that we ought to have a different one person yeah. for this. Uh, maybe but, we can have it go to the rec committee. I mean, just on that topic, like maybe we can appoint or, uh, you know, assign this project or this review of the application to the rec committee. You know, like the preliminary, uh, you yeah, know, review I'm, I'm or just, whatever. Yeah, I'm trying to come up with something. Uh, yeah. So. Before, you, before you fall asleep, I think that what you should do you should go on on the town website if you haven't and read some of the comments back from our insurance provider. It's not insurmountable. I mean, what you need to do is look and see what they suggested you do that we have you do and that we do. And if you can meet those, then you you may have a better vote next time. It's just that I want to suggest somebody <clears throat> else that they could con in contact with. Right. Um, Drew's taking about the rec committee. You can try that. Can ask them. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm willing to to be a select board liaison. If, if, okay, mm -hmm. I I think that would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to take the pressure off the town administrator. Absolutely. So, yeah. so um, Larry, I mean Mr. Gilbert, can can you direct your request to Carl? Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And he has contact information for him on the website. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for everyone coming. Thanks in everyone. And participating in the yeah. robust. Discussion. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, our next item is access permits on Horn of the Moon. Do we want to take up Rosie's so she can go home? I can make the chart from here. Okay. Yeah, this isn't going to take long. Access yeah. permit. Yeah. Okay. Access permit uh, for Patrick Sullivan on 2416 Horn of the Moon Road. Judith has a hand up. Oh, Judith. Yes. Oh, you, you, you're, you're muted. muted. Um, sorry. Um, I just had a question. Um, the way that the property is described, it's in a residential area, yet the need for the access permit um, or the additional cut was to, you know, assist in the farm operation. Um, so. The, I, I wasn't quite appreciating the need and it appeared inconsistent with the current use of the, uh, so that, um, yeah, I, I was concerned about that discrepancy. You're saying that you're concerned whether it needs a access permit? Yeah, uh, the application, it's checked off for the properties residential, but the narrative that we, you know, um, 
the reasoning for it is to facilitate the farm operation and perhaps in the future have some residential housing for farm workers. So it wasn't identified as an agricultural use. Um, that, that's my question or concern. Yeah, if it was ag use, you wouldn't have to have an access permit. Mm. You do not have to have one. Yeah, no, so I, 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 I yeah. get that. But the re, uh, and I don't know where this came from because it's not in the application. I think it was in the. Uh, um, yeah, this, this is really me. I talked to uh, Tyson about it. So I knew that he was speaking with Mr. Sullivan um, and Guthrie. So okay. this is really my commentary, not necessarily directly just from my speaking with the road foreman and the zoning administrator. Yeah, so I, I guess I'm not understanding what the need is, like why there's a need for a second driveway in this residential. Because they're going to build some farm housing. But okay. farm housing is a, a resident for somebody to live. Yes, and also. I yeah, think that's also, why it's probably checked the way that it is. It's so they're trying to do it right by not saying it's just farm access. They're trying to do it. It could be somebody living there. So they need a okay, driveway. That, I, I just had a question or. Is that okay though? I yeah, mean, no, I'm, I just wanted to identify that. That's okay. Fine. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So it looked like this was okay with Guthrie. Yes. Yeah. And it looks like the, um, the potential farm housing, like there are no they're, issues with that. They're they're currently working with with Tyson on that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where they are. I don't know if the official permits even come in yet. It's uh -huh. in discussion, but it just let's go ahead and get the current path going. Yeah. Okay. So, so Tyson Tyson wants us to go ahead and, and uh, he thinks it's right for us to make a decision. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, he was fine. He's just I just don't think they've gotten the permit completely. It's been discussed, but yeah, I don't think the official paperwork's been finalized yet. Yeah. Okay. So what Guthrie says it needs a culvert. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, the drawing was actually done by the landowner as well and showed a culvert. It's on the right. back of your okay. last your second page. Yeah. So we can uh, oh so if we approve the permit as it's written, then will culvert be mandatory? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. So I think we need a motion. Well, I'll I'll be on the winning side of a motion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I move to approve uh, this access permit twenty three zero zero three. I'll second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. The ayes appear to have it. They do have it. Um, we just need to sign it, right? Yes. And yeah, Seth right has here. the original. I have it right here. Um, Okay. All right. Always doing oh, that's right. Um, okay. So access permits done. Discussion on town management. Why the COVID nineteen? We're low. <laughs> the numbers are what they say they are. Okay. And um, I'll I'll make further observations in for an additional meeting in the future. We have COVID tests with, for anybody yeah. watching the video here. With an eye on the office. clock. Oh, very good. Yeah. Time management call. Uh, we have warrants. Yes. I looked them over. I thought they, there's nothing exciting at all about them. <laughs> Most boring warrants I've ever seen. Are they really? Quote me on that. No, they've ever <laughs> seen. <laughs> <laughs> John, you're saying you want that in there. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and attributed to you. Uh, so while we're doing the warrants, we have a town administrative report. There's really not much on there. Tyson's out this week. Forgot to take February 20th off, but he was out last week too. Um, and the next meeting schedule, obviously next week is regular meeting on Monday, but that will also be the town meeting forum. Yep. Town meeting on Tuesday. And then the next one we have is March 20th. And then... April 3rd. So if everyone can just check their schedules and yeah, I won't be I here. Some, I won't be here on the third, but I could I could zoom in. I think I have some really bad news for you guys. I, I will not be in I will not be at Tom meeting. <gasps> what? I can't do it. What? I can't. Uh, what? I'm speaking of the camera, I can't. <laughs> uh, what? I'm gonna I, I have an opportunity to go to Colorado for the week. 
So I'm we sorry. did that instead of town meeting. I don't want to tour. Can I come by. too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I really, I, I mean, I'm kind of, I'm a little upset about it, but it'd be a lot more, my wife would be a lot more upset if I said I was going to town meeting. So, That's true. <laughs> so you know how they say, a happy wife is a happy life. Yeah. I have to keep that. <laughs> so you won't be there. I will not be there. Wow. Uh, okay. I'm, okay. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so town administrative report, yeah. you, that's it, Gene? Yep. You got me in all kinds of trouble here now. <laughs> other, other business? Yeah, some other business. Okay. So due to a series of unfortunate yeah. oversights, I guess is what we'll call it, the Article 5 for the Kellogg Hubbard Library Appropriation did not get printed on the ballot. Mm -hmm. Number of reasons for it, none of them are great, but it is what it is. So after speaking with the town attorney and with the Secretary of State's office, not in that order, um, we have... The solution to the problem is that we will need to call another meeting. We will need to, the select board will need to adopt a resolution after town meeting stating that this was in fact an oversight um, and that, that we will, it'll be basically another election. It won't be another town meeting per se, the in-person thing, it will, um, be a single ballot with a single question on it, um, a single yes or no. The thought process is that we handle it exactly the same as we did the other ballot in that we mail it out to all voters because that's how we did it the first time, um, which is an additional cost. I apologize. Um, so we aren't able to make the resolution or warn any meeting until after town meeting, which is next week. You folks don't have another meeting scheduled until the 27th, which would- The 20th. Oh, 27th. sorry, the 20th. Okay, I thought that was on the 27th, so the 20th. So the earliest that we would be able to hold another meeting would be Thursday, April 20th. So, I guess what I want you to think about is, do we want to keep to having all elections on Tuesdays? That's what people are used to. Do you have any issue with having this particular election here at the town office? And when would we like to, do we want to do this prior to the 20th of it, the 20th, your meeting on the 20th? I'm yeah. not aware of any budgetary reason why it would need to be done any sooner because I don't believe the funding goes out to the Kellogg Covered Library until well after July 1st. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, why do we have to have another meeting? Because, because it was duly warned yeah. and it didn't appear on the ballot. Okay. And we can't vote for it on the floor because it was supposed to be printed. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Um, and we can't put out ballots now. Really. We, we can't reprint the current ballot. And basically your, your town meeting ballots have to be available within 20 days of town meeting. Oh, okay. So we already did that once. Right, yeah. So, it's yeah, so because our ballots have already gone out. Too close, yeah. It's too close. Yeah. And if we were to try to say, have that happen tomorrow, um, anyone could actually dispute the result of the that, that that article as well as the result of the other other articles on the ballot, and we don't want to do that. Oh, they could they could dispute the other ones. Yes, Ooh. because they could say people didn't have the opportunity to research or vote or vote the way they wanted to, or that people were gone and weren't given the same twenty day period. And so you can't have the vote, the new vote, within a certain amount of time. It's got to be warned at least 30 days after town, town meeting. meeting. And I mean, if you wanted to have an impromptu special select board meeting on town meeting night, then mm -hmm. you could certainly do that to just take care of this one resolution mm -hmm. so that we could create the warning. Actually, I would have the warning ready for you. So that you could authorize a warning to do it, um, but there's no huge rush. Pardon? No huge rush. Anyways. No, there isn't necessarily. So if no. you want to wait until your meeting on the twentieth, that's fine with me. I just 
want to be able to go to the Kellogg Hubbard Library, explain what the situation is, and what the resolution is. I didn't want to go to them with a problem and just say, hey, we don't know how we're going to handle this. The resolution is... The resolution is that the select board move a resolution that we hold a special town meeting for the purpose of voting for the Kellogg Hubbard Library article. So are you asking us to take a vote tonight? No. Okay. No, no we're I'm just asking, trying to figure it out. I'm asking yeah. about timing. Got it. Okay, so I want to see if this is something that you folks are willing to act on on the 20th or if you wanted to do it sooner. Okay, so if we do it on the 20th, then you say we have to have a town meeting. We have to have it's it's an election. Yeah. It's just like when the school when the school merger was right. happening every month, we had a new election. So we have to mail out ballots everybody. We will have to mail out ballots. They will have to be provided so that they're 20 days out in advance. Yeah. Okay. And then the meeting, we have to have an actual physical meeting? No. Mm -hmm. No. No, we have to have an informational meeting 10 day, uh, yeah. up to 10 days prior. That's and that may right. actually be a good time for the Kellogg Hubbard Library folks to come in and chat if they want to. We already heard them. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. We're done so, with that. So le legally, what, uh, if I understand correctly, this is a special town meeting. No, no, I get it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the only item is yeah, the a, an Australian okay. ballot item. So, so I don't know whether our moderator needs to come. And no, he does. Oh, okay. okay. He does. Nothing on the floor. Okay. He doesn't have it. it basically, know. it's mailing out ballots. It is mailing out ballots. Yep. Yep. And, so and, and conducting an, elect an election. And then, yes. 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Yeah, staffing, exactly. counting yeah. the ballots. Right. Yeah. yeah. So um, I have talked to my head, my head election counter, Becky Reed, and just confirmed with her that she's okay with us doing just a plain colored piece of paper with an insert in it explaining this this article was missed yeah. on town meeting. Please vote this ballot as you would have on town meeting, return it to us, or whatever the language is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, we don't need to use the tabulator, so there's no, no programming. It's a simple yes or no. Ah. We can simply do a hand count. Um, it's not anywhere near as complicated as regular town meeting is. Mm -hmm. um, I do apologize for the error. There were um, many extenuating circumstances um, first of all, this is the first year I've ever been involved with it. Yes, I know. And it, it, I don't think it's your, it was a bunch of people didn't catch it. So it's all of us. A bunch of people <laughs> didn't catch it. And I was one of them. So, but, yeah. So, okay. But I did get um, some feedback from one person on the BCA, and it's not a bad idea. Um, so next year, we're going to have one select board member and one JP, compare the warning and the ballot. Very good. Yeah. I nominate Carl. Side by side. <laughs> and I will ask for volunteers at our pre town meeting, BCA meeting, because it's a really quick turnaround. We literally have 24 hours mm -hmm. to get it done, mm -hmm. which is part of the problem, frankly. Um, so that's, that's sort of um, more of a check and balance and yeah. fix to the problem. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a good idea. And that's mm -hmm. where I was coming from is just this kind of a big thing and how can we prevent it in the future? Right. That, that's really where we're at. And, you know, the solution is, as you say, we'll have the meeting on the 20th of April and pass the resolution. And 20th then, of March. Like, no, it's April. You said. April would be when the election would actually happen. Okay. So March 20th. Yeah, March 20th is Slug when I would, meeting, March 20th. I would yeah. propose that you okay, I will have a, a warning ready okay. for you and prepared as well as the language for the resolution. Mm -hmm. And once that resolution is moved, I'm going to ask you to sign that warning and it will be posted the next day. So the but so the, the election has to be 30 days after that's right. town meeting. Right. Yes. No, after that. No, resolution. it can't be. No, yeah. It can't be within the time period days. that time meeting is. We had town meeting. Yeah. Okay. Town meeting happens on the seventh. We have right. to wait until after that to do the resolution. Yes. And then after that, we have to wait thirty days to. Uh, yeah, we, it has to be posted and not noticed for yeah. thirty days. Yeah. 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 And we'll do the informational meeting ten days prior. Yes. So. Yeah. Does anyone have any issue with having the election on a Tuesday as we normally would? No. I don't. That's fine. I would also propose that we hold it here. Perfect. Yeah. That way, the office is still open to the public. Yeah. Right. 
And yeah. um, although it is a little out of what people are used to, it has happened here before. No, we've done it here before. Yeah. Yeah. That's so fine. If you're, you're just going to send out a piece of paper, just like a very simple, non technical ballot. Correct. How, if people want to mail those back or drop those there, is there going to, I mean, is it the same kind of thing where you're signing outside envelopes? Absolutely. Or, oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's the same exactly envelope. the okay. same, except okay. the, the envelopes will be what I have in stock. They're larger. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be the basic certificate envelope. If, you know, you put, you put yeah. your ballot, put it in the envelope, sign the envelope, mail it or drop it back. Okay. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep. Thanks okay. for scrambling to figure out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Now we have to go into a direct session for the municipal. I move to go into executive session to discuss a personnel issue. And Deirdre, would you like me to just catch you up on this? And you did. You did. Yeah. Oh. Very quietly. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, the ayes appear to have it. Uh, the select board of East Montpelier is out of executive session. Um, but no, <laughs> we have a little action. I move to accept the counter proposal of the candidate as described to us. I'll say. Second. Very good. I'd be used to it. <laughs> uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The ayes appear to have it, they do have it. The next step in the program? Um, is to adjourn. I move to adjourn. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. And Judah seconded us. Oh, man, I all those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs>